Hi, I'm Stephen Prince. I'm very pleased to be talking with you about Redbeard, a very special film by Kurosawa. I will concentrate on three things in my commentary. I'll be speaking about Kurosawa's filmmaking style, how he shoots his scenes, where he puts his camera, how he blocks the action for actors and camera, how he edits his shots, and how he uses sound. I'll be speaking about what Kurosawa wanted to say with this picture, those aspects of Japanese history on which he based the film, and the things that influenced him in designing the movie. I'll speak about the place that Redbeard occupies in his career. It foreshadows the next films that he would make, and at the same time, it's a film in which a lot of things in his career come to an end. This is the last film in the most productive part of Kurosawa's career, and it's a long film that is divided into two parts. The first part has three acts, and the second part has two acts. Since his first film in 1943, Kurosawa had been working prolifically. Redbeard was his 24th film. After this, however, he begins to have tremendous difficulty raising funding for projects. In the next 28 years, he will make only seven films. During the 1970s and 1980s, he only makes two films in each of those decades. Kurosawa uses music in a very untraditional way. We'll say more about this later in the commentary, but here it's worth noting that he has composer Masaru Satu pause the music periodically under the opening credits so that we can hear the ambient sounds of the world around the Koishikawa Public Clinic. We hear the cry of distant characters, the sound of wind in the trees. And then the music resumes. Most filmmakers will write music under the complete sequence of the opening credits, but Kurosawa here alternates music with ambient sound. We begin the film with Yasumoto before the gate of the Koishikawa Public Clinic. The name Koishikawa references a period in Kurosawa's own life. It is the name of the district in Tokyo that his family moved to when Kurosawa was a young boy. Several sections of the film will take place before this gate. The repetition of this motif will give structure to the film's long and sprawling narrative. Redbeard is Kurosawa's last black and white film. Although black and white was still a viable format in the mid-60s so that filmmakers didn't need a special reason for working in it, Kurosawa was a holdout coming to color slowly and only then because of his relationship with cinematographer Takao Saito. As Kurosawa himself admitted, Saito taught him how to work in color. Kurosawa's films look very different after Redbeard because their lighting changes, and because the stylistic energy that Kurosawa had put into camera movement and editing, he now put into his highly saturated and aggressive color designs. The completion of Redbeard, then, marks the beginning of a big change in the visual tone of Kurosawa's work. <laughs> Filmed in an aspect ratio of 2.35 to 1, Redbeard is Kurosawa's last film in a string of anamorphic widescreen productions. Every Kurosawa film since 1958 had been in the 2.35 to 1 Toho scope ratio. The Hidden Fortress, The Bad Sleep Well, Yojimbo, Sanjuro, High and Low, and of course Redbeard. These films established Kurosawa as one of the great widescreen filmmakers of all time. By working in this ratio, he was making films for cinema, not television. Except for a brief return to it in Dersu Uzala, Kurosawa never again worked in this ratio. On his remaining films, he used spherical lenses and shot in a ratio of 1.85 to 1, which is more television friendly, and unfortunately, like a lot of filmmakers today, he was splitting the difference between cinema and TV by working in a ratio that could accommodate both mediums. These shots of the patients, as Sugawa and Yasumoto gaze at them, are very interesting. Kurosawa does not individualize them. His camera perspectives are oblique, and the lighting creates the striking shadows that we see under their faces and around their bodies. 
he presents them as a collective, a wretched mass of suffering humanity. We're getting a very misleading portrait of the clinic at this point in the movie. Sugawa is our guide, and he's a shiftless, unreliable tour guide. He's very unhappy here, and he's presenting the clinic as an authoritarian place run by a dictator and a maniac, Redbeard. Take a look at this shot. You almost never see this kind of conventional depth perspective in Kurosawa. This is conventional one-point vanishing perspective. Kurosawa shoots all of his shots with telephoto lenses. That previous one was an exception. Most of the time, the space in his shots is very flat and compressed in two-dimensional terms. Kurosawa uses those lenses for a variety of reasons, some of which have to do with his desire to create exceptionally good working conditions for his performers. The tour continues. Sugawa takes Yasumoto to a room housing a number of patients. Sugawa and Yasumoto look in on these patients, and Yasumoto asks about why there is no tatami. Sugawa tells him that all the rooms are the same, it's like a prison, and that all of these are Redbeard's ideas. This patient now, who's speaking, has his dignity affronted because he doesn't feel it's quite right not to be sleeping on tatami. Sahachi is going to tell him the reasons why. Alone among these patients, Sahachi is a character who's penetrated to the deepest sources of wisdom, a wisdom that he shares with Redbeard and that Yasumoto will come to share by the end of the film. As Sahachi tells us, it's more sanitary not to be sleeping on tatami matting, which holds the dirt and the moisture and the germs. The actor who plays Sahachi is Sutomu Yamazaki, whom Kurosawa had used two years before in High and Low, where he played a kidnapper who snatches Toshiro Mifune's child and plays the character with a very insolent body language. He doesn't have a lot of dialogue, but there are a lot of scenes in High and Low where he's moving about in the most insolent fashion. And it's a striking transformation in the performance style to see him here as Sahachi. That latitude of performance is something that Kurosawa, like all the greatest directors, would get from his performers. The film is based on a novel by Shugoro Yamamoto, a popular writer who was a contemporary of Kurosawa, who was seven years younger than Yamamoto. Kurosawa made two other films based on works by Yamamoto, Sanjuro in 1962 and Odeskaden in 1970. He remained fond of this writer and he wrote yet another script based on a Yamamoto novel. After Kurosawa died, director Takashi Koizumi filmed that script as Amagaru, After the Rain. Redbeard, however, has another literary source and that is Dostoevsky's novel, The Insulted and Injured, from which Kurosawa has borrowed a major character and numerous scenes some of which he has filmed almost exactly as Dostoevsky wrote them. As the conjunction of Yamamoto and Dostoevsky indicates, Kurosawa's artistic sensibility is very powerful, and his interests are so diverse that his adaptation of the Yamamoto novel is a free one, building from the book but going well beyond it. Meanwhile, our tour of the clinic continues, as Sugawa shows Yasumoto the south side of the clinic that gets the sun and the damp north side which, much to his chagrin, is reserved for the doctors. Yasumoto at this point, it has to be said, shares Sugawa's impressions. This is not the kind of clinic that he envisioned himself working in after being educated at Nagasaki. We now meet the kitchen staff. This group of women will serve as a chorus later in the film commenting on the action and characters, and Kurosawa will weave them in and out of the storyline. We're building up now to the introduction of our star performer, Toshiro Mifune. Sugawa is a little bit intimidated by Redbeard, and Yasumoto is going to be equally intimidated when he does come eye to eye with Redbeard. 
All of these rules that Sagawa is complaining about, he attributes to Redbeard, and he sees them as part of the injustice of the dictatorial fashion in which Redbeard runs the clinic. We're about to meet the most important actor to work in Kurosawa's films, the actor who is so closely identified with his work, and that is, of course, Toshiro Mifune. Yasumoto comes in, and when Mifune turns, we will see why Kurosawa loved this performer so much. There's a lot of suspense that's being built here. We've done a gradual approach to his room, and now we shoot him from the back. As he turns, Kurosawa will cut right about here to a front view of a glaring Mifune. And it's this ferocity, it's this intensity of emotion that Kurosawa appreciated in Mifune and that no other performer really gave Kurosawa in quite the same manner. We have now, therefore, with this film, to say goodbye to Toshiro Mifune. This was the last time that Kurosawa and Mifune worked together. Redbeard was their 16th film. Between 1948, the year that Kurosawa first uses Mifune, and 1965, the actor appears in every Kurosawa film except for Ikiru, and he grew to be such an essential part of the movies as to become, in a sense, Kurosawa's on-screen persona. Now all of that ends with Redbeard. Like the cold and remote tone of Hitchcock's later films, Kurosawa's work after Redbeard lacks the charismatic performances that such a powerful star can deliver. With the loss of Mifune, Kurosawa's films lose their popular appeal. The end of this relationship with Mifune is also the end of heroes in Kurosawa's work. Kyojo Nide is the last Kurosawa hero, along with Yasumoto. This is the last film of its kind, a story of heroes and wisdom, of spiritual growth and enlightenment, of living right and doing well by doing good for others, the kind of film that Kurosawa had been making since 1943. We now meet Handayu More, the other doctor who works at the Koishikawa Clinic. Unlike Yasumoto and Redbeard, More is not a brilliant physician, but he is very dedicated to his work, and he tells Yasumoto that if he's patient, that he can learn a lot here, despite the humble appearance of the clinic. Yasumoto has aspired to be the Shogun's physician, and he studied in Nagasaki. It will be helpful here to take a moment and sketch in some of the historical background that Kurosawa is drawing on. One of the striking things about Kurosawa as a filmmaker is that he will invoke a very detailed historical setting, but he won't explain much to the viewer. It's very significant that Yasumoto has been to study at Nagasaki. That is the port where Western medical science made its entry into Japan in the 17th and 18th centuries. Since 1641, Dutch traders operated a merchant office on the island of Dejima in Nagasaki, and their staff routinely included medical doctors. It was through them that Western medicine and procedures began to make headway in Japan, which had, in 1638, closed itself to the Western world, except for the port at Nagasaki. The aspirations of our main character, Yasumoto, to become the Shogun's physician are consistent then with the advanced medical training that he received at Nagasaki. There were interchanges between the doctors at Dejima and the Shogunate staff. The Shogunate's physicians were familiar with Western medical procedures, so Yasumoto's place of training and his ambitions fit in the historical time frame. The Japanese called the Dutch red hair persons because of the striking characteristic that distinguished them, and they called the medicine that the Dutch practiced red hair medicine, or red hair surgery. The name of Kurosawa's film, therefore, and of Toshiro Mifune's character, evokes this period of medical history and the influx of Western science. Redbeard is on the vanguard of medicine for his day. He is also a traditional Japanese physician in that he emphasizes the mind-body connection. He's not just 
an empiricist. He doesn't just see symptoms. He understands that illness is a sign of some deep emotional, psychological wounding. He practices surgery, but he sees into the hearts of his patients. He is therefore a figure that bridges pre-modern and modern, that bridges East and West. Yasumoto is in a very petulant mood now. Uh, he's really unhappy that he's going to have to spend some time here at this miserable clinic. And he's about to run into the herb garden. What you see now is a wonderful sequence in which Kurosawa demonstrates his mastery of the moving camera. Here we go in the first of six shots. We track with Yasumoto as he runs down, track with Sugomu, Yasumoto, Sugawa, and now Kurosawa even catches Yasumoto as he backs up. Now we track forward again with Sugawa. To get the shots, Kurosawa had his crew lay a line of track parallel to the direction in which the cameras are running. The cameras mounted on a dolly and crew members push it along the tracks. A dolly can weigh as much as 1,000 pounds, but it rolls very easily. And you saw how fast they get the camera moving there. Since only one camera is used here, Kurosawa shot separate takes of each character. For each take, the actor ran the entire length of the track. Kurosawa then intercut this footage to get the edited series of six shots. The artistry of the shots lies in the perfect synchronization of camera and actors. Kurosawa has perfectly matched their speeds. Today, with the Steadicam, which is a handheld portable camera unit, directors can easily get moving camera shots. Filmmakers can even cheat by using zoom lenses to create the appearance of camera movement. But in a zoom, it's only the optical elements inside the lens that move, not the camera. Kurosawa called this kind of zoom shot, which fakes camera movement, very wrong. And he added, that the camera should follow the actor as he moves. It should stop when he stops. Kurosawa worked very hard to get his moving camera shots, and his disdain for the zoom lens shows how much he loved the sensation of motion perspective, which only a moving camera can convey. He was a master of these fast, sensuous moving camera shots. Rashomon stunned audiences in 1950, in part because of Kurosawa's camera moves particularly during a remarkable sequence of 15 tracking shots lasting two minutes that follow a woodcutter into the forest, one moving camera shot after another unfolding in continuous fluid motion across the uneven forest floor. These tracking shots in Redbeard are the last of their kind. In Dersu Uzala, he does some short tracks along a riverbank, but the moves there are very slow. And as for the fast editing that we saw, Kurosawa does do that again in Ron during the big massacre scene, but the shots that he's editing there do not contain the kind of fast and sustained camera moves that we have just seen. This shot during the dinner sequence is a good example of Kurosawa's mastery of widescreen composition. He's arranged the doctor's across the length of the frame, side by side, facing the camera. In other words, he's shooting the space in the scene as if it were a plane, rather than a depth or a volume. Kurosawa's approach to space, in fact, is planar. He uses his telephoto lenses to compress space, to foreshorten relationships. And he tends to place his camera in this kind of setup where it is in front of or somewhat outside the dramatic space of the action. This is a very frontal and formal composition. Redbeard now gets up, exits, commanding Yasumoto to bring him his notes. Yasumoto views those notes as his private personal property. Redbeard's understanding of medicine, by contrast, is more communal. The notes are there for the good of all science. This is going to precipitate more sulking on Yasumoto's part. 
the visual design of Kurosawa's work changes after Redbeard, and the frontality of this scene, the planar conception of space, the lack of editing, the stillness and quiet in this scene is evidence of those changes. In place of the motion and visual excitement of Kurosawa's earlier work and the scene that we just witnessed in the garden, Kurosawa in his later films will emphasize the static frame and the long take. This dinner sequence in Redbeard is a foreshadowing of that emphasis on stillness and quiet that typify the later films. We now go into a scene with Osugi and Yasumoto in the garden, and this scene is going to show us a number of very striking components of Kurosawa's shooting method. The scene is composed of five shots, all photographed with a telephoto lens, and you can see how flat everything looks here, how foreshortened all of the space is. The telephoto lens is Kurosawa's lens of choice. Virtually all of Redbeard will be shot with that lens. Each cut in this scene to a new camera setup changes the field of view by exactly 90 degrees. Kurosawa loved to set his cameras up at right angles to one another. There we see a 90 degree shot change. And look carefully at the apparent positioning of Osugi and Yasumoto in relation to one another. There's a lot of space between them. Remember that when we cut here to this shot. We're shooting along the camera's line of sight now, and it seems as if Osugi is right on top of Yasumoto. That's a distortion of perspective that the telephoto lens has caused. Multiple camera filming with setups at 90 degrees was Kurosawa's customary method of shooting a scene. In the films before Redbeard, it is only one approach among others that he uses. After Redbeard, it becomes his preferred approach. So in this sense too, the film is transitional. The 90 degree edits that we've been observing in this scene introduce some continuity problems in Kurosawa's films, at least if we approach cinema from a strict technical and textbook approach. The shot of Yasumoto and Osugi with the tree between them compared to a composition like this one, and here we see the shot with the tree, does not match in terms of the positioning of the characters. They look much closer together than they did in the previous shot. Strictly speaking, this is a continuity error because the shot perspectives don't match up. The mismatch is due to the optical distortion caused by the telephoto lens. Telephoto lenses will make things look closer together when they are lined up along the camera's line of sight, as our characters are in some of the shots in that scene. Kurosawa invites this problem with his 90-degree setups and his telephoto lenses, but clearly he doesn't worry about it terribly much. It's more important to him to work in this way, shooting with multiple cameras, operating at the same time, and setting them up in relationships of 90 degrees to one another. Later in the film, we're going to see an even more spectacular example of mismatched perspective. We introduce Sahachi again. He's out there in the clinic courtyard working for some patients. He's made a practice of this, working very hard despite his illness, and then using his earnings to buy food for the patients. The clinic staff cannot understand this. They say that he's a bother. His behavior is very perplexing. There are many points in the film where one of the characters will remark, as Handayu Mare does here, <laughs> things are all too much. It's not right that one has to suffer in the way that the characters do in this film. Kurosawa is painting a very dark world here. We go now with a wipe to Yasumoto's room. Yasumoto still sulking from the perceived injustice that has been done him by being stuck here at the clinic. Honda Yomori comes in to try to reason with him and persuade him to get with things. No one's going to sympathize with Yasumoto's offended ego. We're leading now into the climax of Redbeard's first act. Act one in Redbeard is Yasumoto's encounter with the mantis. 
The film is separated into two parts. Part one has three acts and a coda. Part two has two acts and a coda. The film's first part dramatizes the young doctor's moral awakening under Redbeard's tutelage. And this awakening occurs through decisive encounters with three characters, the mantis, the gold lacquer craftsman Rokosuke, and the saintly Sahachi, each experience teaching Yasumoto a valuable lesson. When he meets the mantis, Yasumoto is haughty and full of himself, as we see him here, having evolved his own diagnoses and medical approaches while working in Nagasaki. He will cure her, there is no question about that in his mind. She, of course, understands this and plays on his foolishness and self-involvement. She is going to exploit his need to be in control and in a superior position by presenting herself as a victim. His error in judgment is symptomatic of the wrong-headed pride that blinds him to the truths of life and that will deliver him to the upper class, ministering to cataracts and constipated bowels, the indolence and social irresponsibility of the wealthy and privileged that Kurosawa condemns in this film. Osugi now runs up to tell Mori that the mantis has escaped. She's lurking about the grounds somewhere, and she's about to put in her appearance. Yasumoto takes a sip of sake. He's going to assume his reclining position. Kurosawa will go back to this shot, this framing of Yasumoto before his door. Notice how compressed the space looks because of the telephoto lens. In just a moment, the mantis is going to appear. We hear the Kurosawa wind howling outside, telling us that things are going to get very bad very soon. Now look at this composition here, how close together they seem to be. The next cut is going to give us this more spectacular continuity problem that I alluded to earlier. And now when we cut to our next shot here, Look at how far apart they seem to be. This shot that we're in now is the longest in the film. It runs just under five and a half minutes. It's a splendid example of Kurosawa's fondness for the long take, of doing an entire scene in one shot, of working within the frame rather than between shots. Instead of attacking him like he half expects her to do, the mantis falls to her knees and pleads for his help. She's going to draw him to her, and this shot is all about that seduction. Kurosawa is going to dolly the camera forward at four points during the scene, four moves that will draw us into this seduction and visualize it at a subliminal level. The first move is coming up. When she says doctors in uniform are no good, playing on Yasumoto's own similar conviction. He creeps forward, and Kurosawa moves the camera a little bit closer. The uniforms are the emblem of a clinic doctor, and Yasumoto will be damned if he's going to wear one. They think alike. He draws closer, and now he stoops down, and the camera pulls in a second time. Notice that each move reframes the action to keep Yasumoto and the mantis near the edges of the frame. This constancy in their positioning helps to make the camera move more subliminal. The visual change, the growing intimacy of the space between them, becomes one that is felt by the viewer rather than seen. Furthermore, each camera move is scored musically with ominous notes played on the flute Obviously, these are telling us that Yasumoto is not being very smart, but they also serve to make the viewer concentrate on the dramatic situation, on what might happen or may be about to happen, and not on the camera moves. The third move occurs here, as she turns away from Yasumoto, feigning embarrassment at relating her story. She's shrewdly cueing Yasumoto to respond in terms of his professional role. I'm a doctor, don't be shy. The Kurosawa wind is howling outside, telling us, like the music, that something bad is about to happen. 
I call it the Kurosawa wind because it's an element of nature that he will use at moments of danger or dramatic intensity. It's wind as theater. He uses it very theatrically to externalize conflict in a dangerous world, and often, as in Seven Samurai, Yojimbo, or Redbeard, he'll put dust in that wind to add clouds of energy around the characters. The fourth camera move occurs when she reiterates that she cannot go on with her story, prompting Yasumoto, like a puppet, to insist that she do so. In a moment, she's going to fake panic and flee from Yasumoto. First, she'll draw him to her once more. She turns. You can see how still this scene is overall, how there's really a minimum of movement and how every movement is precisely choreographed by Kurosawa. It has a role to play in this seduction. When she fakes her panic and flees from Yasumoto, Kurosawa is going to follow the action inside of this shot. He is not going to cut to a new camera setup like most filmmakers will do. He's intent on what's happening inside the frame rather than on the meaning and the relationships of meaning that he can create across shots in an edited sequence. Here she goes now. Her panic is growing. He's certainly going to harm her. She's gonna back off now into the shadows, a little bit out of the lighting and then when she runs around Yasumoto and crosses to the other side of the frame, you can see that there's a hot spot there in the center where Kurosawa's lights are bouncing off the back wall. So he still hasn't edited. He still has not cut to a new camera setup. He's saving that cut for a decisive moment, and it's going to occur as she leans into Yasumoto. And now we have our cut. She's got him. She's going to wrap that kimono sash around his back. He's allowing her to collapse against him for comfort. And that new setup, that new camera setup, shows us the mantis springing her trap. She pulls the hairpin. She's trapped his arms. She's going to throttle his carotid artery, shutting off the flow of blood to his brain, and then kill him with her hairpin. Kurosawa is a male-oriented director. The characters in his movies are men with only one exception, a film he made in 1946 called No Regrets for Our Youth. It has a female protagonist. With that one exception, all of Kurosawa's stories have been about men. Redbeard is a part of that package. We should point out, therefore, that the Mantis is a character, unlike the others, who does not get an extended biography in terms of someone who occupies a lot of screen time, someone whom we get to know. There's a, a sexual suspicion here of her by Kurosawa. We see her as a praying mantis, killing her mate. She achieves even a sexual pleasure as she closes in for the kill. And then just as She's about to finish Yasumoto off. In comes Redbeard to the rescue. And Kurosawa is going to take us out of this very long and slow moving scene with an astonishingly fast transition. Redbeard is going to burst in and the camera will tilt up and then we're gonna wipe to a shot of Yasumoto waking up under Redbeard's shadow. 
Sometimes in film you don't want things to be too subtle, and the shadow imagery is one example. It neatly and clearly portrays the master-pupil relationship between the older and younger doctor that is at the heart of the film. Redbeard tells Yasumoto that the mantis was born with her compulsion to kill, and that many other people have had experiences without turning out as she did. This sounds like a very harsh verdict, but it is consistent with the philosophy that Kurosawa has expressed throughout his work. He has always insisted that it is the choices that we make, within the circumstances of life that we inherit, that determine our morality and our freedom. In this he is very much an existentialist. He has said that personality is destiny, that fate lies not in the social environment or in one's social position, but in how one's personality adapts to that environment or position. He has rejected the idea that bad conditions breed criminals, and said that many people in this defective society survive without resorting to crime. Kurosawa has explored this issue of nature versus nurture before in Stray Dog, a film that he made in 1949. He insists that his characters choose the course that their life will take, and they are defined by these choices. This makes his work, and certainly his characters, a bit odd within the context of traditional Japanese culture, where social standing, family, and group norms are powerful sources of identity. Redbeard's words about the mantis, then, are consistent with Kurosawa's existential vision, and their harshness shows just how austere are the terms of the challenge that Kurosawa sets before his characters and his viewers. Yasumoto turns away from Redbeard to hide his tears. Redbeard reaches forward to wipe them away and realizes that that would be even more humiliating than what Yasumoto has just been through. So he fakes a cough, <coughs> pretends to blow his nose, and we get a little bit of humorous music as Kurosawa tries to lighten the mood a bit. As we fade in, Yasumoto is unwrapping the bandages from his wound, and he's going to gaze at the uniform that he has refused to wear. The main musical theme, derived from the last movement of Brahms Symphony No. 1, which itself echoes Beethoven's Ninth, plays tentatively. This lovely little scene is a caesura, a resting point, and it's going to bring Act 1 of the film's first part to an end, with a reminder of the importance that the clinic uniform plays in the film's evolving drama and as a way of symbolizing Yasumoto's own moral growth. Handa Yumare now comes in and asks Yasumoto to go to North Ward Number 1. This gets Yasumoto's hackles back up. He feels like he's being bossed around by Nide. He puts the uniform back in the closet. Putting that uniform on is going to change his life, and it's not something that he can do easily, and only after he undergoes a few more terrifying experiences. We are now in Act Two, which is the story of Rokosuke, the gold lacquer craftsman who is dying of cancer and who will not speak to anyone. Redbeard asks Yasumoto for a diagnosis, and the young doctor offers a competent one. It is consistent, however, with the Western medicine that he has absorbed at Nagasaki. All he sees are the physical symptoms. He misses the deeper significance of the man's illness, which only Redbeard at this point in the film understands. I remarked before that Redbeard is a character who bridges pre-modern and modern, who bridges East and West. He complements the empiricism of Western medicine with the spirituality of Eastern medicine. For Redbeard, illness is not a disease of tissue, but a disease of the human heart. Illness is always the outward sign of some deeper trauma or injury at the core of one's being. And we are going to have those stories recounted for us by Kurosawa of Rokosuke and Sahachi. 
Act two and Act three of the film's first part are the stories of Rokosuke and Sahachi, stories which serve to prove the wisdom of Redbeard's outlook. Life inflicts trauma upon those who would endure it. The film's medical drama, then, is a peculiar one, unconcerned with disease as a physical pathology, or indeed with any kind of physiological bodily response to sickness or injury. It is the existential pain and horror of being in the world that Redbeard tries to alleviate for his patients. He wages a battle against the human condition, understood in cosmic terms, not against disease organs or tissue or against social problems that might cause illness. This is a very important point, and it signals a major shift in Kurosawa's thinking, which will take him, after Redbeard, into the melancholy and pessimism of Dersu Uzala, Kagamusha, and Ron. Kurosawa as a filmmaker is now moving beyond political solutions to the problems that he depicts in his movies, and he is giving voice to that idea in this scene here. Most of the patients at the clinic are very poor, and the clinic only operates because the government doles out a small amount of funding for its needs. In Nide's perspective, the funding is not enough, and it's never going to alleviate the kind of problems that are bringing people here to the clinic. So he's got great frustration with the existing political order, but at the same time, he has a suspicion that illness has its sources at a deeper place than politics. Nide seems to reject the idea of a political solution, even though he acknowledges that the poverty in which his patients live is responsible for much of their sickness. Kurosawa's vision is shifting away from a fight against the specific social conditions of post-war Japan that he portrayed so memorably in Drunken Angel, Stray Dog, Ikiru, The Bad Sleep Well, and High and Low, and toward a more timeless depiction of human suffering, a depiction that reaches its most vivid expression in Ron. In this regard, Redbeard is a transitional film, taking him from the social politics of those earlier pictures to the more detached view that his work assumed in the 1970s and 1980s. Now we go into this extended and remarkable scene where Yasumoto does as Nide has instructed him, watch Rokosuke die. It is one of the film's more extraordinary moments. Redbeard has told Yasumoto that a man's last moments of life are a solemn occasion, and he has asked Yasumoto to watch this closely. Yasumoto does, but he is overcome by what he sees, suffering and pain. Kurosawa fills the soundtrack with the terrible gasping of the old man's last moments. It is a wordless scene conveyed through this sound and through Yasumoto's intense and fearful gazes to and away from Rokosuke. Redbeard wants Yasumoto to grasp the mystery of death, the strange threshold that defines the boundaries of medical knowledge. Yasumoto, though, at this point in the story, is yet too literal-minded too confined by his social standing and the habits of mind that it has given him. The strangled, choking noises of the dying man are virtually the only sound in the scene. All that he can see and hear is an old man alone and dying in pain. He has not yet begun to look into their hearts. 
He's rescued from his ordeal by one of the clinic staff. He now, though, has to endure another trial, and it is one of the key scenes in the film because it reveals much about Kurosawa's philosophy of life and art and much about the details of Japanese medical history that he is evoking in the film. Throughout his movies, Kurosawa subjects his heroes to a series of trials that test their courage and their strength. And he does this because trauma is basic to his conception of growth and education. Kurosawa recalled the shocking and dangerous experiences of his own life, nearly drowning as a child, witnessing the death and destruction of the great earthquake of 1923. And he said that the more shocking the experience, the more clearly he seemed to remember it. From each of these experiences, he extracted a lesson. His characters must do the same. Accordingly, Yasumoto now has his trial by fire. He is thrust into the brutality of a surgical operation carried out under harsh 19th century conditions. Some of the surgical details here are surprisingly graphic. This is more than Yasumoto can bear and he turns away, prompting Nide to command him not to do so. This command is Kurosawa's personal philosophy as an artist, and he defines being an artist in precisely these terms. He says, being an artist means never averting one's eyes. The true artist confronts the wretched aspects of existence, as well as the good ones, and does so without flinching. He loved this quality in Dostoevsky. I know of no one so compassionate, he said about Dostoevsky. Ordinary people turn their eyes away from tragedy. He looks straight into it. This idea of not looking away is the core of Kurosawa's philosophy of art and life. The surgery that Redbeard performs on this young woman is a medical act of daring and courage, and it establishes that he is a komogeka physician, that he has studied the surgery of the red hairs. It presupposes a knowledge of anatomy, which also derived from contact with the Dutch. The influx of Western medicine into Japan occurred primarily in the surgical arts. Internal medicine in Japan was very well established and highly respected. It rested on theoretical and philosophical principles and did not require knowledge of anatomy. During the samurai wars of the 15th and 16th century, battlefield physicians practiced a form of wound treatment called kinsoi. They applied pressure to stop the bleeding from wounds caused by swords and they closed these wounds by wrapping them in cloth and then sewing the ends of the cloth together. Apart from kinsoi, there was no tradition of surgery in Japan as it existed in the West. The language barrier that separated the Dutch and the Japanese helped to create a bias in favor of surgical methods when Western medicine began to make its inroads. The detailed medical theory that was relevant to the practice of Western internal medicine was probably beyond the grasp of the initial translators, who were governmental appointees sent to facilitate trade with the Dutch. Surgical procedures, by contrast, were relatively nonverbal. They could be demonstrated and learned by observation. Yasumoto is now going to volunteer to go help look after Sahachi. He fainted during the operation. He's not yet ready to work at Redbeard's side. And it's perhaps possible that he's recovering a bit of face here by going to help out. It's also a sign of his gradual and deepening moral involvement in the life of the clinic and of the degree to which he is still laboring under the shadow of Redbeard as his master and mentor. Let me return now for a moment to the historical background of the surgery scene. Yasumoto faints. He's not yet ready. 
Redbeard, though, is clearly such a physician who has studied the methods of the Dutch or has learned from those who have. This makes him another of Kurosawa's characters who transgress the boundaries of socially conventional and normative behavior. By displaying Redbeard's prowess, especially in the detail of anesthesia, Kurosawa may be evoking the accomplishments of Japan's greatest surgical pioneer, Saishu Hanoka, who studied in Kyoto under a doctor trained in the school of surgery established by Kaspar Schamberger, one of the earliest doctors at Dejima, who was there from 1649 to 1651. Hanoka performed surgeries for a wide range of conditions, including tumors, gangrene, ulcers, and cancer. Hanoka's greatest contribution to the art of surgery lay in his development of a drug for anesthetizing his surgical patients. He spent 20 years researching and perfecting the drug and even tried it in experiments using his wife and mother. He used it for the first time in surgery on October 13, 1804, 42 years earlier than the first date of the use of surgical anesthesia in America. The surgery that Hanoka performed in 1804 was a mastectomy on a victim of breast cancer, and he went on to do another 150 such operations. Kurosawa's portrayal of surgical anesthesia then inevitably evokes the career of Saishu Hanoka. Furthermore, the scene contains the only nudity in all of Kurosawa's work, and it may be that he intends the exposed breasts of the patient to refer to the type of surgery that Honoka often performed. Kurosawa used this surgery then, and the application of anesthesia that it involved, as signs of modernity a modernity taking root in traditional Japanese medicine by way of Western culture. The patient in the scene may not have seemed to be anesthetized, but let us remember that she does have her side open and her internal organs exposed, indeed even falling out. She would be thrashing around even more violently were she not under partial anesthesia. Yasumoto now watches the three little children of Okuni, Rokosuke's daughter, as they somewhat warily approach the rice balls that the clinic staff have left for them. Kurosawa brings us into this scene using a reverse field cut. The camera perspective in those two shots changes by precisely 180 degrees. Kurosawa is the only director who uses reverse field cuts systematically throughout his films. This scene gives us Okune's narrative of her father, Rokosuke, during which she relates the terrible family history, a history of suffering and wretchedness that has left Rokosuke in the condition in which we see him at the clinic. This is another of the film's very long scenes which involve little overt movement by characters on screen. A long scene of stillness and quiet punctuated by this almost unbearable story of unhappiness and wretchedness. Kurosawa has long dealt with illness in his films. Characters have been sick in various ways throughout Kurosawa's work. In this sense, Redbeard is a culmination of that focus. It is worth tracing a little bit of that history here during the time that Okune is going to be relating her family history. The focus upon illness in Redbeard is consistent with this long development in Kurosawa's filmmaking, with one key difference. In the past, Kurosawa has construed illness in terms of its social and political dimensions. Illness has been a metaphor for social problems of one kind or another. He has used it as a way of indicting society for its injustice and its corruption. In Redbeard, the terms of that indictment are not as intense. And as I suggested earlier, the film indicates a shift in Kurosawa's thinking away from 
a direct confrontation with social problem. As Nide says, politics never seems to get around to doing much of help. In Kurosawa's 1948 film, Drunken Angel, Sanada, the doctor hero, is treating a gangster named Matsunaga for tuberculosis. And his disease emblemizes the blight of social collapse in post-war Japan, specifically the black market corruption that sprang up in a nation devastated by war. Mosquitoes breed TB in a cesspool that is the film's symbol of the collapse and confusion of a nation ruined by the Second World War. Like the relationship between Yasumoto and Redbeard, the bond between Sanada and Matsunaga in Drunken Angel is a master-pupil relationship in which Sanada's cure for the young gangster involves much more than simply eradicating his body of TB. It's to be a reformation of mind and body, persuading Matsunaga to give up the outmoded behaviors of the Yakuza, the gangsters, who flourished in that post-war environment. In that film, though, Kurosawa's tragic sensibility prevails. The master-pupil relationship fails. Matsunaga succumbs to TB and the gangsters. In Ikiru, Watanabe's cancer is both a physical disorder and a symptom of the crushing drudgery of city hall bureaucracy, which Kurosawa indicts for its anti-democratic tendencies and its political corruption. Watanabe battles his cancer and the bureaucracy so that he might live long enough to push a park project for slum children through the system to completion. In Record of a Living Being, Nakajima, the hero, has a fear of atomic weapons that terrifies him to the point that he can no longer function. And the illness that Kurosawa examines in that film, therefore, is not physical, but psychological. Ironically, though, for Kurosawa, Nakajima's fear is the sanest response in an insane world that accepts the prospect of nuclear annihilation as normal. The film ends with Nakajima in the asylum, labeled crazy by the value system of Cold War power politics. The killers in Stray Dog and High and Low suffer terrific anxiety and fits of agitation. In these ways, and in their alienation, they are characters from Dostoevsky. Their rage comes from their awareness of economic injustice, of great wealth and great poverty coexisting in the same society. Their crimes and their underlying mental suffering are a perverse means of protesting this injustice. Kurosawa's depiction of physical and mental illness in these films attaches it to specific social problems so that the sickness of the individual comes to mirror the sickness of society. He has used illness as a metaphor as a means of addressing social and political problems. His filmmaking up to Redbeard then was fully engaged with such issues, as he pointed to the failings of post-war Japanese society. In Redbeard, this begins to change as his focus shifts from social critique to a more timeless view of human suffering. The story behind Rokosuke's suffering then, as Okuni relates it, has little to do with any social pathology. It is a story of human cruelty, pure and simple. This now is a key moment. She needs the reassurance that her father has died peacefully. Redbeard lies, saying that he has. And she says, indeed, he must have. Otherwise, life would be too cruel. This now leads us into the film's first really magisterial moment. Yasumoto recalls Rokosuke's terrible death. Now, though, it is transformed. He's lit with hard light on top of his head and from a high angle which gives his face a beatific cast, and his cries of pain are gone, replaced by a burst of music. That is a variation of the Haydn and Brahms themes that are used in the film, associated with healing and a reopening of the wounded heart. With the pain gone, Rokosuke's death becomes a moment of transcendence. That is to say, it has its mystery restored. 
the mystery that Yasumoto could not see before because of the suffering. Redbeard's lie gives relief and release to Okuni, and her story about her father's patience, charity, and love gives back to her father the human dignity that the pain and suffering of death had stripped from him, at least in Yasumoto's eyes. The old man's love for his child and his grandchildren transfigures his life and the meaning of his death, and the flashback that we have just seen visualizes this transfiguration. It is the film's first powerful stylistic expression of the ideal of helping others that informs Redbeard's work at the clinic and provides the measure of heroism and truth in Kurosawa's work. This scene with Okune is going to conclude Act Two of the film's first section. Before we can end it, however, we have to resolve some plot issues. Okuni has stabbed a character, and Redbeard is going to need to intercede with the magistrate in order to keep her free so she can raise her children. In the meantime, her children are going to be housed at Goheje's Inn, just outside of the clinic. And Kurosawa is going to take us to that scene with a series of spectacular transitions that provide a striking visual contrast to the quietness, the stillness, and the sheer duration of this scene. Before we go out of this scene, we have to settle the business of Okune's children. Children in Kurosawa have been very significant kinds of characters, and he has frequently used them as a reference point for portraying the difficult conditions of the world and of life. Later in the film, when we meet Otoyo, she is going to be a child of 12 years old, through whom we are going to come to see the essential social problems that surround the clinic and which hinder Redbeard's efforts to help his patients, though he no longer holds out hope for political solutions. There's our wipe, an extreme telephoto compression of the distant patients. Now we tilt down past the gate as the Kurosawa wind howls filled with dust, creating lots of energy. We pan and tilt the camera to follow Sahachi. He calls out to Onaka. And now he's going to wipe to a fierce rainstorm. And there's that wipe. In comes the rain. The kids peer out the window. Another telephoto shot. The wind and rain are pitched at a level of extreme intensity. And the wipe, Kurosawa's favorite optical transition, takes us from place to place in a fast and aggressive manner. The stylistic contrast of the long, slow scene with Okuni and the speed with which Kurosawa takes us through these storms outside the clinic creates an explosive opposition of stillness and agitation. Kurosawa loved to join scenes together in this manner, and significant other examples can be found in Throne of Blood and especially in High and Low where the first section of that film, an hour in length, is confined largely to one set, with no physical action but an escalating emotional tension that is suddenly released in a tremendously exciting scene on board Japan's bullet train. He is one of the rare directors who uses both the long take and montage to create explosive outbursts of activity that follow long, sustained scenes of inactivity. It's a quality of narrative that he found and loved in the fiction of Dostoevsky. That writer's novels are filled with long scenes of sustained intensity and slowly developing action that are punctuated by sudden outbursts of emotion. Kurosawa wasn't the only filmmaker to notice this about Dostoevsky. Sergei Eisenstein, director of the battleship Potemkin, a film that uses this organizing principle, referred to what he called the unsurpassed dynamics of inner tension in Dostoevsky. 
Kurosawa then uses this narrative method to take us into Act 3, which is the story of Sahachi, containing the film's most explicit statement of Kurosawa's moral philosophy. Redbeard has had the dying Sahachi and Okuni's children taken to Goheji's house outside the clinic. Goheji is played by Aijiro Tono, a Kurosawa regular who appeared most prominently as the innkeeper in Yojimbo. The prelude to Sahachi's story is this long scene at Goheji's, punctuated by the arrival of Hakichi, a drunk who says bad things about Redbeard, and Redbeard's own reflections about extorting the money from the magistrate for Okuni's children. For Hakichi's griping, Kurosawa uses a long take, we are inside of it now, that runs nearly two minutes, and for Redbeard's reflection, an even longer one that runs for three minutes and 15 seconds. Kurosawa has been filming with telephoto lenses throughout the film, but their effects are especially apparent in this scene. In the compositions that show the group of characters clustered around Sahachi, notice how dense and compacted the space on screen appears to be, with people looking like they are stacked up on top of one another. Because the camera is far away from the action, when you shoot with a telephoto lens, your camera is actually at some distance from what you are photographing. It is the lens that magnifies things. It compresses space and perspective, flattening the appearance of shots, making them look two-dimensional. This two-dimensional appearance is one of the most striking and recognizable elements of Kurosawa's film style. Directors have definite preferences for certain kinds of lenses. Orson Welles and Martin Scorsese, for example, prefer to shoot with wide-angle lenses. Kurosawa has always preferred to work with telephoto lenses, which are also called long or long focus lenses because the barrel of the lens is quite long, with a lot of separation between the glass elements at the front and rear of the lens. Here's one of those group shots where you can see how stacked up people appear to be. Film critics sometimes seem to suggest that everything on screen has some meaning or intended meaning that the interpreter can uncover. Filmmakers, though, often do things simply because they like the way that it looks or because they enjoy the work that creating a certain design involves. Kurosawa used long lenses because he loved the smoky, flattened look they create. He never worked with wide-angle, deep-focus composition, and he never put things right into the face of the camera the way wide-angle lenses permit you to do. Beyond his sheer affection for telephoto perspective, Kurosawa had some very practical reasons for shooting with long lenses. By backing the cameras far away from the actors, he felt that he got better performances. This, working in a way that is good for the actor, is one reason that he used long takes, which permit actors to play characters in the real time of the extended shot. A second practical reason that Kurosawa used long lenses was his tendency, from the 1950s on, to shoot scenes with multiple cameras. Multi-camera shooting virtually requires the use of long lenses. Because the lens magnifies distant objects, it sees less from side to side. That makes it easier for a director to use multiple cameras on a set without the cameras seeing one another. The small angle of view can be used to exclude one camera from the field of another. And using multiple cameras enabled him, again, to work in a way that was good for the actors. He could film an entire scene in one block of time without having to interrupt the flow of the drama and the actor's performance by shooting close-ups and alternate angles. His multiple cameras gave him those alternate views and the material he would need to edit the scene. So Kurosawa's elements of style form an interlocking system, a set of choices whose consequences are interrelated and that enforce the character of the filmmaking.
Kurosawa has used two cameras to shoot this scene. One is giving him a master shot view and the other he's using for a close-up view. It's a relatively unconventional approach to the shooting because he's keeping both cameras with the telephoto lenses outside the scene's action. The unconventional results of this filming approach are evident with Hakichi's arrival. When you get a chance, take a look at the first cut that occurs after he arrives. He stumbles around a bit, shakes off the crowd, and leans forward to look at Sahachi. He reaches out to touch him, but the crowd pulls him away, and Kurosawa places the cut there, from a tight framing to a somewhat looser one. The angle of view in both shots is so similar, and the optical change produced is so minimal, that this would be considered a very bad cut within the parameters of conventional filmmaking. You can see another instance of this at the end of the scene here, when Redbeard leaves. As he picks up his umbrella, Kurosawa will cut to a new framing that shows his face. That's a large difference in shot content, but it's accompanied by minimal difference in the camera's angle of view. There it is. This shot is only slightly off axis of the previous one, and there is no change in the camera to subject distance. Conventionally speaking, that's a bad jump cut. The standard practice is to use cuts, shot changes, to produce big differences in the field of view, as when going, for example, from a medium shot to a close-up, which involves a change of shot content and camera position. Filmmakers generally avoid shot changes that do not produce big alterations of this sort. All of this is unimportant to Kurosawa, as were the technical errors in perspective that we noticed earlier, produced by the 90-degree shot changes. He is a filmmaker with a singular method and style. Cinema really is a very conventional medium, with one person's movie looking much like someone else's, except for the work of its greatest artists, whose style takes us in a wholly new and singular direction. Kurosawa is one of these artists, and his style is so powerful that in collaborating with great and brilliant cinematographers, it's the Kurosawa style that consistently comes through. He wasn't a director who, like many do, depend on a cinematographer to tell him how a scene needed to be lit or where the cameras should go. The elements of style that I've been describing are there in the films, regardless of whether it was Asakazu Nakai, Kazuo Miyagawa, or Takao Saito who shot them. We now go into the story of Sahachi, which is the climax of the film's first section. It is Act 3. In it, Kurosawa gives us some of the most exquisite filmmaking of his entire career, particularly in terms of the use of sound. The hushed snowfall when Sahachi and Onaka meet, the rush of wind through the chimes at the fair. Here is that wonderful snowfall. There's such a sense of quiet and beauty that Kurosawa conveys here. The tinkling of the bell hanging from Sahachi's herb basket and then outside of his room when Onaka comes to say goodbye. Kurosawa uses these sounds to create an aural motif that links together the episodes in Sahachi's story. And the delicacy of the sound that the chimes and the bell produce stands in for the tenderness and the fragility of the feelings that pass between Sahachi and Onaka. The sound comes to embody the relationship between these characters. Kurosawa has always been an innovator in the use of sound. Redbeard, for example, was shot with a four-channel soundtrack that separated dialogue, music, effects, and ambient sounds, and this presentation of the film gives us a very rare opportunity to hear something of the multidimensional sounds that Kurosawa created for the work. Hitherto, Redbeard was only available in this country with a mono soundtrack. When Kurosawa was active as a filmmaker, monaural sound, provided by an analog optical track, was the norm for film, as it had been since the 1920s, and it was a highly unsatisfactory format. Analog optical sound has a very limited frequency range, so that loud or high-pitched sounds become distorted and low-volume sounds vanish into the hiss of the optical track. As a result, most films included little sound information in their mix beyond dialogue and music. 
certainly nothing like the rich, enveloping set of environmental ambient sounds that Kurosawa gives us in Redbeard. As I pointed out, he had composer Masaru Sato write pauses into the music score during the opening credits so that viewers could hear and appreciate all of the ambient sounds from the world surrounding the clinic that Kurosawa has provided. In a sense, he was showing off his soundtrack. The inadequacies of optical monaural sound kept the sound mix on most films relatively simple and unexpressive and few filmmakers really thought much about how to use sound in an active and creative manner. Kurosawa was one of the few who did, and as far back as the 1940s, he developed what he called the multiplier effect of sound and image. The idea that cinematic meaning derives from the way sound multiplies and changes the meaning that would be in the picture alone. In films like Drunken Angel, Stray Dog, and Ikiru, he created striking, often contrapuntal and oppositional, sound-image combinations. He also took isolated sounds in the mix and heightened them, emphasized them in ways that went beyond realism and into the realm of poetry and style. The amplified hoofbeats of the horses in Throne of Blood and Seven Samurai, sound in close-up laid over an image in Longshot, are striking examples. And then, Sahashi says, the great earthquake came, and we go into this wonderful sequence. Filming the earthquake scenes that Sahashi narrates gave Kurosawa the opportunity to work from his own personal experience. He witnessed the great Kanto earthquake of September 1, 1923, which destroyed Tokyo, Yokohama, and surrounding areas of Japan's central plain. Tokyo and Yokohama were densely packed industrial areas, and 140,000 people were killed in the destruction and resulting fires. The quake measured 8.3 with its epicenter southwest of Tokyo. And even for Japan, which is located in one of the world's most active earthquake zones, the devastation was enormous. We should understand these images, therefore, as not entirely fictional. <laughs> The quake hit just before noon. Kurosawa had gone downtown that morning to visit a bookstore, and he was never sure afterward how he had managed to escape the fire and destruction. Shugoro Yamamoto, who wrote the novel on which Redbeard is based, worked at a pawn shop in Tokyo that was destroyed by the quake. So both filmmaker and novelist had the opportunity to experience the terror of this earthquake. Kurosawa rushed home, thinking that his parents were surely dead. But they had survived, and Haigo, his older brother, persuaded him to go back into the city so they could view the destruction. This trip with Haigo became one of the central and defining passages in Kurosawa's life. Haigo was four years older than Akira, and Kurosawa adored this brother and worshipped him as the kind of wise and powerful master that Kurosawa would go on to create in so many characters like Redbeard. This scene here is one of the wonderful examples of sound. The rush of the bells here conveying the rush of emotion that Sahachi feels as he sees Onaka again. Kurosawa recalled that he and Haigo saw a burned landscape as far as they could see, filled with corpses charred black, some half burned, corpses in gutters, in rivers, on bridges, and in the street. There was every manner of death that a human being could experience. Akira turned away, but his brother said, look carefully now. They stood by the Sumidagawa River and saw the banks choked with corpses, Kurosawa thought it was like the lake of blood in a Buddhist hell. The river was swollen with naked, bloated bodies. Kurosawa started to faint, rather like Yasumoto during the operation. But Haigo held him up and said, Look carefully, Akira. That night, after he and Haigo returned home, he slept soundly and with no bad dreams. 
Surprised, he told Heiko about this, and his brother explained in a way that provided Kurosawa with the philosophy of art and life that he carried with him ever after. Heiko said, If you shut your eyes to a frightening sight, you end up being frightened. If you look at everything straight on, there is nothing to be afraid of. The journey with Heiko had been a trip to banish fear, the kind of trial by fire to which Kurosawa would subject his filmic heroes, and whose outcome is a state of enlightenment. But not for Sahachi and Onaka. Sahachi has not yet attained his inner state of enlightenment. The earthquake has torn them one from another. And in this farewell scene, Kurosawa gives us some extraordinarily beautiful filmmaking. The intricate choreography of their leaving and turning and their missed glances. Throughout, the imagery is rendered two-dimensional by the telephoto lens. Sahachi tearfully asks if they won't meet again, and Onaka dissuades him from his hope. She now begins to move off, and the depth compression is so extraordinary that it almost appears as if she is not covering any distance. Sahachi turns, and we have now this wonderfully choreographed sequence of missed glances. He turns, she pauses, he turns away again. The silence offset by the tinkling bell He looks back again, rushes toward her, the echoing baby's cry. The use of sound is so subtle. Now she turns, of course, and he doesn't see. The sound of the solitary bell evokes the tenderness that they feel for one another and the aching loneliness that their separation is going to cause. At the end of the scene, Kurosawa gives us this exceptionally eloquent shot. Sahachi sees Onaka bow to him, and framed in long shot, he ran to her. Sadly, she starts down the far steps, and Kurosawa tilts the camera down to the bell hanging below the herb basket. He holds on the bell for a moment before cutting out of the scene. The camera tilt has taken us from a literal to a poetic level of meaning and has used sound and its image to put a period at the end of the scene. In these high-angle shots of Sahachi's face, as he lies on tatami telling his story, Kurosawa has put the camera high up in the rafters of the set, and the close-up framing is due to the magnification of the image by the telephoto lens. This next scene, when Onaka visits Sahachi and commits suicide, is another of the film's very long takes. Almost the entire scene is done in one four-and-a-half-minute shot. As Onaka collapses in his arms later in the scene, Kurosawa will use an axial cut to show a closer framing of the couple, and then another axial cut back out to the previous framing. But apart from that editing, most of the scene will play in a single, extended, long take. With her death, Sahachi realizes that he has inadvertently hurt Onaka, her child and her husband, and he decides to make amends for this by being useful to others. Sahachi has grasped the essential truth that all of Kurosawa's heroes learn that responsible living lies in seeing to the welfare of others. Thus, as ill as he is, Sahachi works to buy fish and eggs for the other patients, and they revere him as a saint. This idea is the lesson that so many Kurosawa films have been driving at. Drunken Angel, Stray Dog, Ikiru, Seven Samurai, No Regrets for Our Youth. The heroes of those films build parks for slum children, defend a farming village against bandits, become policemen to protect society from its stray dogs. Kurosawa wants his viewers to be like the heroes of these films. He wants young people to be like Yasumoto and Redbeard. This is why so many of his films portray master-pupil relationships. It allows him to show the process of enlightenment, 
in which a younger and unformed person learns the lessons of responsible living through experience and the guidance of an older, wiser master. Kurosawa began putting this idea on film in the years following the Second World War, when the nation was devastated and looking for the way toward a new future. Kurosawa took part as an artist in this process of social transformation. He said, I felt that for Japan to recover, it was necessary to place a high value on the self. In this view, stressing choice, freedom, and the obligation to serve others might provide a path for social recovery. And so he set about putting these values into his films so that they might honor a Buddhist inscription that moved him tremendously, benefit all mankind. Thus, in Kurosawa's films, we see the strong heroes rising above the rest of the people. But this individualism, this emphasis on the self, in Kurosawa's work is paradoxical. The paradox of individualism for Kurosawa is that it must lead to greater self-sacrifice, the kind of sacrifice that we see Sahachi undergoing at the clinic, where he works himself to death for the benefit of the other patients. This outlook stressing self-sacrifice is rather different from our Western understanding of individualism, which frequently leads to a position of isolation and selfishness. Dostoevsky perhaps provided the best explanation of this paradox in the terms that influenced Kurosawa. In his 1863 Winter Notes on Summer Impressions, Dostoevsky wrote, Voluntary, fully conscious self-sacrifice, free of any outside constraint, of one's entire self for the benefit of all, is, in my opinion, a mark of the highest development of individuality, of its highest power, its highest self-mastery, the highest freedom of one's own will. There is thus no contradiction in Kurosawa's work between its stress on individualism and on interpersonal obligation. Kurosawa had plenty of sources within Japanese culture for this means of connecting the individual and the group. The ethos of the samurai warrior, for example, for which he felt such tremendous attraction, held service and duty to one's lord and to humankind in general as the warrior's highest responsibility. He translates the samurai's duty to honor his lord with loyalty and to serve as the protector of all classes in society into the obligation of his heroes to serve humanity. And he takes the ideal of Bushido, the formalized code of the warrior, which was given written form during the Tokugawa era, with its stress on self-discipline and the honing of one's physical and mental skills to their highest peak, and he draws his heroes in terms of these qualities. In The Brothers Karamazov, Dostoevsky wrote, make yourself responsible for everything and for all men. You will see at once that it really is so, and that you are to blame for everyone and for all things. This is a harsh and even terrifying idea. And yet, these are the terms of living that Kurosawa's heroes accept, and then do battle to fight corruption and social oppression. Sahachi grasped this truth, and his legacy for Yasumoto and the patients at the clinic is the example that he left of an unselfish life. Along with Redbeard, Sahachi becomes a teacher for Yasumoto. And the second part of the film is going to show us how Yasumoto puts into practice his lesson. We're coming now to the end of this extraordinary long take that occupies the body of the scene during which Onaka has related her story. Kurosawa is going to end the scene with a striking flurry of edits that will begin when she picks up the knife. She first has to wrap things up with Sahachi, atoning for the suffering that she's caused him. In her way, Onaka has grasped something of the principle that 
is going to animate Sahachi's life after she dies. She understands that her actions have affected him very deeply and that in these last moments of her life, she needs to account for that. Now she readies herself and Kurosawa is going to be ending this scene with a series of axial cuts, that is to say shot changes that occur along the camera's line of sight. We're going to cut into closer view there. That's an axial cut. The line of sight in both shots matches. And now we cut back out. Again, an axial cut. Kurosawa is the only filmmaker who uses that kind of editing, setting his cameras up in this axial fashion. It's a very unique and singular aspect of his visual style, an unmistakable element. Kurosawa frames Sahachi's last moments using the high angle camera setup that I discussed earlier. But as Sahachi talks of building a workshop near Onaka's grave and says that everything he did for his neighbors was in her memory, Kurosawa is going to intercut a shot of the weeping patients who are clustered around Sahachi. They are undefined by the lighting, dressed in dark clothing and weeping in the shadows, while Sahachi's face is brightly lit and in a beatific way that recalls the earlier flashback image of the dying Rokosuke. The lighting in each case transfigures the moment of their deaths to mark the significance of their lives. Kurosawa shows Sahachi's death with images of exquisite beauty. Sahachi gives one last recitation of the truth that he has learned, namely that he must live for others. And then he's going to call out to Anaka. As he does so, his arms will reach out and their shadows will be thrown on the far wall. Kurosawa is going to occlude the moment of Sahachi's death. That is to say, it's not going to occur on camera. Instead, we're going to be focusing on the shadows themselves. Now he reaches up. I find this extraordinarily tender and beautiful. There's the shadow imagery. And then when those arms fall, we know he's gone. The patients close in. And now comes my favorite moment in the film, a wipe, Yasumoto walking down the alley. It's where everything in the first part of the picture comes together. Sahachi has died. Yasumoto hears that wind chime. He turns, sees the hanging basket there at the end of the alley. He grips his hands with resolve, walks forward as the main Brahms-derived theme begins. Yasumoto turns again, looks, and continues. The musical theme is stated more assertively. With another wipe, Kurosawa shows Yasumoto stepping out of his room, wearing finally the clinic uniform that he had scorned. This is the turning point for Yasumoto the moment where he acknowledges his acceptance of all that he has seen and learned at the clinic. And it is tied to the story of Sahachi by the presence of the wind chime. Kurosawa had established the aural motif, the delicate sound of the bell, throughout the flashback to Sahachi's story. But who was prepared for him to extend it in such a beautiful and moving way into the present time frame of the film? It works because the emotional logic, the poetic logic, is so right. And that logic has no literal basis in the narrative. Nothing in what Sahachi has said has established that Yasumoto should know about the plant and the chime. But he does. And he does because it's emotionally right. It's a moment in the film of pure formalism where the style transcends the literal details of narrative to make a connection, one that is felt through sound between Sahachi and Yasumoto, a connection that illuminates the moral teaching that has passed between these characters and that is fulfilled when the young doctor puts on his uniform.
As he steps out in that uniform, Act Three comes to its end. A coda now follows, which we are in. The coda does two things. It gives us a portrait of the aristocracy, which would otherwise be unseen because the action focuses on the poor patients at the clinic, and it introduces the character of Atoyo, who will be the principal focus in the second part of the film. Honda Yu tells Yasumoto that Redbeard is angry because the government has cut the clinic's budget, which will result in the cancellation of outpatient treatment. Kurosawa introduces here the theme of governmental neglect of the people and the poor, a critical view of the upper class that will be developed further in the scene with the obese lord whom Redbeard and Yasumoto visit. In the 1950s, the Japanese economy took off, surging with strong growth in what came to be called the economic miracle. World War II had destroyed the country's manufacturing base, and there were severe food shortages and hyperinflation. Ten years after the end of the war, however, Japan entered a period of fantastic economic growth that lasted until 1970. Before the war, the nation's growth rate was about 4% per year, from 1955 to 1965, the annual growth rate was 10% and then rose to 12% in the latter half of the 60s. The nation put the economic collapse of the war years behind it and all seemed well. Kurosawa, though, did not celebrate this economic miracle. In his films of contemporary life, Ikiru, Record of a Living Being, The Bad Sleep Well, and High and Low, he openly questioned the degrees of freedom available in modern society. He showed how insulated from the popular will and public scrutiny were the elite government and corporate institutions that made decisions affecting the national welfare, the close partnership between government and business, and the closed system that results when one political party, Japan's LDP, retains power for decades. The bureaucrats and businessmen in these films make their decisions in secret, for reasons of self-interest, without public accountability and having to answer to the press. Kurosawa remained deeply suspicious of the materialism that pervaded modern Japan. In Kurosawa's view, an abundance of consumer goods did not guarantee a healthy society or a good life. The young adults he depicts in Stray Dog, Ikiru, Record of a Living Being, and Rhapsody in August are greedy, grasping, selfish, and superficial fools. Kurosawa said about Redbeard, I think that the terrible reality that I describe is exactly that of Japan today. How else to explain the contrast, the discrepancy between what one sees, the appearance of prosperity, and the deep reality? If you only look at the economic expansion of the last few years, all the misery of the people is evaded or hidden. The current prosperity is based in misery and it will collapse. Though this is a period film, Kurosawa is talking about contemporary Japan in Redbeard. And in this section of the film, dealing with the bloated lord that Redbeard is visiting, Kurosawa shows us a caustic and contemptuous portrait of the indifference of society's elite to the misery of the people. This lord is bloated and constipated, physically deformed by a life of ease and indulgence, a life that is pleasantly insulated from the misery that surrounds him outside of his property. The portrait is satirical and funny, and it is not just the elite that is being condemned here. The man's bloat and constipation are the products, as Redbeard says, of a life of indulgence and comfort. They are, therefore, symptoms of the materialism of modern Japan, and indeed of any advanced capitalist society, whose members are encouraged to live lives in pursuit of selfish pleasures. And this character is determined to pursue those pleasures at all costs. He has ignored Redbeard's dietary instructions and has gotten worse since the doctor's last visit. As in his other period films, 
Kurosawa here finds the seeds of modern life in an earlier time. The foundations of Japan's modern economy and politics were laid during the Meiji Restoration that began in 1868 and in the late Tokugawa era that preceded it, which is the period setting of this film. Kurosawa thus finds in the enduring political institutions of the Tokugawa period an analogy to the modern era, with its conjunction of wealth and political stability on the one hand, and widespread immiseration on the other. As an expression of his anger, Redbeard charges the Lord a steep price for his care. We have to pause here to mark and to celebrate the actor who is now appearing on screen. This is Takashi Shimura, one of the most extraordinary actors to work for Kurosawa, who had been with him from the beginning. Shimura signed with Toho Studios in 1943 and promptly appeared in Kurosawa's first film, Sanshiro Sugata, and went on to work with the director on another 21 films. In Kurosawa's work of the 1940s and early 1950s, Shimura often played a master or mentor figure, and often with Toshiro Mifune as the pupil, in Drunken Angel, Stray Dog, and Seven Samurai. Even when he didn't play the role of a master, the gentleness and benevolence of Shimura's persona infused his characters, as in Shanshiro Sugata and especially Rashomon, where his character makes a humane and moral gesture at the end of the film that allows the story to conclude on a hopeful note. Shimura's greatest contributions to Kurosawa's work come in his lead performances in two of Kurosawa's masterpieces, Ikiru and Seven Samurai, in which he plays a wizened, frail bureaucrat dying of cancer and the robust samurai warrior who leads the band of adventurers in defense of the farming village. Watanabe, the bureaucrat, and Kambe, the warrior, are the quintessential Kurosawa heroes. And it says much about the director's respect for Shimura that he entrusted both characters to this actor. The two pictures were made consecutively, and Shimura's physical transformation from the one character to the other, from Watanabe who can barely stand, unaided in the late stages of his disease, to Kambi, spectacular at full draw on his bow during the climactic fight in the rainstorm, is one of the most astonishing displays of acting virtuosity in the history of cinema. The social criticism that Kurosawa developed in the scene with the bloated lord, he now extends to the sexual practices of the Tokugawa period, and also of modern Japan, to the extent that these practices persisted into the 20th century. Specifically, these involved the forced sexual slavery of young women, sold into prostitution at home and abroad. To introduce the character of Otoyo, Kurosawa gives us a portrait of a Tokugawa-era brothel. It is gated, walled off, and guarded, as was the most famous of the Tokugawa-era red-light districts, the Yoshiwara, which opened for business in the capital, Edo, in 1618, and operated throughout the Tokugawa period. The first walled compound of prostitution, however, was established several decades earlier in Kyoto, during the reign of Hideyoshi Toyotomi. The licensed brothel district at Yoshiwara was surrounded by a moat and was accessible through one gate, which enabled watchmen to monitor traffic into and out of the district. In 1869, there were 153 brothels in Yoshiwara, with more than 3,000 courtesans. Nagasaki had 24 brothels concentrated on two lanes and employing hundreds of prostitutes. While considerable glamour surrounds the high-class courtesans of Yoshiwara in literature and folktale, it is significant that Kurosawa avoids this kind of depiction and instead shows Tokugawa-era prostitution in terms of its ugliest face, as a system of sexual slavery sustained by poverty and involving children, as indeed it did. 
poor families from impoverished farming and fishing villages regularly sold their young girls to emissaries from brothels who visited the country's poor regions expressly to acquire children. It was a trade in what we would today call child prostitution. But the social norms of the period regarding labor conditions drew no distinctions involving special consideration owed to minors. The Camaro were girls of seven and eight who were apprenticed to a working prostitute and brothel owner. By law, they were not to engage in sexual relations until the age of 15. But in practice, the brothels pressed many girls of 12 and 13 into sexual service, just as Atoyo, who is 12 years old, is being forced to do here. Virgins commanded higher rates, and there were special rituals surrounding the deflowering of 13 or 14-year-old virgins, who would then be called Shinzo, newly launched boats. The entire social structure worked to perpetuate this system of slavery. Girls and young women sold this way were praised for honoring their families and doing their proper duty. In the film, the brothel's proprietress tries to emotionally pressure Atoyo into working sexually by reminding her that she owes a filial debt. The proprietress took her in when her mother died. The life was very hard, the women never escaped crushing debt, and syphilis was common. Moreover, like Atoyo, many prostitutes were beaten and subjected to abuse. The mortality records of 21,000 prostitutes in Asakusa, who died from 1743 to 1801, show that most died in their 20s. Atoyo, then, is trapped within a wholly legal system that is subjecting her to unconscionable abuse. Kurosawa's portrait shows this system in its harshest and most unflattering terms and he is careful to avoid the romanticism and glamour that clings to popular depictions of Yoshiwara and the floating world of pleasure. I think we should also understand this portrait in more contemporary terms. The sale of young women from poor areas in Japan continued into the 1930s and 1940s, especially during times of economic crisis. Because the scene references features of the sex trade that have roots in historical Japan, but have continued into the modern period, we should not assume that Kurosawa is talking only of 19th century Japan. The reclamation of a toyo from the brothel is reclamation from a system of sexual exploitation that has endured, that is both pre-modern and modern. She can be healed, but only if the doctors can remove her from the culture that has rationalized the exploitation of its weakest members. The doctors, though, won't get there without a fight, and Kurosawa knows that his viewers probably need one by now. When Redbeard and Yasumoto try to take Otoyo with them, Kurosawa gives us now the scene that we've all been waiting for, the splendid fight with the brothel's attendants. Kurosawa and Mifune, of course, had already choreographed some of the great fight scenes in the history of cinema. The battles with the bandits in Seven Samurai, the volleys of arrows that turn Mifune into a human porcupine at the end of Throne of Blood, and the sword fights in Yojimbo and Sanjuro, the latter ending with a breathtaking arterial spurt. Kurosawa has shot this fight with two cameras set at 90 degree angles to one another, using telephoto lenses and quick panning movements to follow the action. He's undercranked the cameras by a few frames, which gives the action a slightly speeded up and jerky quality. And this great stylist of screen violence doesn't disappoint. As Redbeard promises, he breaks a lot of bones. We hear them snap and splinter as Redbeard fractures arms and legs and dislocates one man's jaw. And now we see the bleeding compound fractures, bones sticking out in plain view of the astonished victims. And we are astonished too, never expecting quite this level of flamboyantly graphic violence, although the mixture of comedy and horror should be familiar to us from Yojimbo. When Redbeard surveys the carnage he has inflicted and says, I think I went a bit too far, it's hard not to laugh. 
After two hours of intense psychological drama and emotional pain, Kurosawa generously has given us a splendid catharsis and a way to relax as the film goes into its intermission. This is the last time that Kurosawa will show a fight with the kind of high spirits that he brings into play here. The violence in Kagamusha and Ron is sober and despairing, and thereafter he never again filmed violence. The cathartic moment, though, passes quickly. Seeing the fight sends Atoyo into convulsions, and the doctors take her back to the clinic. She will be our major character in the second part of the film, along with the young boy, Chobo, with whom she will develop a relationship that parallels the relationship between Nide and Yasumoto. We pause now outside the clinic gate, the battered child, the suffering of the innocent, indicts the world. What kind of a hell is this in which we live that would cause a child to suffer so? The day is darkening into night. The bare trees show the onset of winter. The world outside the clinic is a hell, torn by earthquake and landslide, holding stories of cruelty, torture, and abuse. Against this world, in a geographic and metaphysical sense, is the quiet healing space of the clinic. Redemption is possible, but only there, and so the doctors must take Otoyo to this protected and sacred space. She is now going to be Yasumoto's first patient, and in the film's second half, Kurosawa will show us whether it is possible to overcome the condition of suffering that he has shown to be the timeless truth of human affairs.
As I mentioned before, the second part of the film consists of two acts. Act one, the longest, is the story of Atoyo, and act two is the story of Chobo, the wild boy that Atoyo cares for. Atoyo is the principal character throughout, and even in act two, it is her relationship with Chobo that Kurosawa studies. Atoyo's healing in mind and body is the subject of the film's second part, and that healing has two stages which correspond to the two acts. The first is her emotional and physical rehabilitation, which occurs under Yasumoto's care, and the second is her ability to act with compassion and to care for a stranger, Chobo, behavior that manifests the moral imperative embodied by Sahachi, Yasumoto, and Redbeard. Kurosawa based the character of Atoyo on two sources, neither of which comes from the Shugoro Yamamoto novel, in which Atoyo does not appear. The principal source is the character of Nelly in Dostoevsky's novel, The Insulted and Injured. But Kurosawa also blends in an incident that he witnessed when he was in his early twenties, and living with his brother Haigo in a bohemian neighborhood of Tokyo, Let's take Dostoevsky first, because so many of the incidents involving Atoyo are transposed from his novel. We see Atoyo reject Yasumoto's attempts to care for her. She pushes his hand away twice when he checks her for fever and tries to lay a cold compress on her forehead. These gestures are based quite exactly on Dostoevsky's character, as is the general narrative situation in this part of the film. Here is the way this action is described in the novel. I was putting my hand on her forehead to feel whether she were still feverish, but quietly, without a word, she put back my hand with her little one and turned away from me to the wall. A bit later, I offered her water and moistened her temples and head. At last she sank on the sofa completely exhausted, and she was overcome by feverish shivering. I wrapped her up in what I could find, and she fell into an uneasy sleep, starting and waking up continually. The Insulted and Injured was published in 1861. Like Atoyo, Nellie is a child of twelve or thirteen, whose mother has died, and who is now living with a cruel woman who beats her and is prostituting her. Like Atoyo, she refuses to speak no matter how badly she is beaten. Like Atoyo, she refuses to wear a dress that the cruel stepmother has given her so that she might attract customers. She tears this dress up and throws it away, and like Atoyo in the film, she is beaten for her actions. Like Atoyo, she responds to this cruelty by obsessively scrubbing the floor. The narrator of the novel, Vanya, finds this abused child and is attacked by the cruel stepmother. Seeing their fight sends Nellie into a seizure, just as Redbeard's fight with the brothel guards causes Atoyo to collapse in a nervous fit. Vanya takes Nellie from her tormentor and nurses her to health. As Yasumoto does in the film, Vanya remarks on what he calls the strange wildness of her expression. Like Yasumoto, Vanya offers her water and moistens her temples and head, but Nellie, like Atoyo, is delirious and does not know how to respond to this kindness. An older doctor visits, examines her, and, like Redbeard, tries to get her to take some medicine, but she refuses. Nellie repeatedly pushes away the spoon, but is eventually worn down by the doctor's kind persistence. Vanya awakens one morning to find Nellie gone from her bed. He discovers her sweeping the floors, but this time, as Atoyo does in the film, she is cleaning not from anxiety, but to repay his kindness to her. For what Vanya has realized is precisely that which Kurosawa has Yasumoto attempt in his dealings with Atoyo. Dostoevsky writes, This wild, embittered little creature must be tamed by kindness. And that is what Kurosawa shows us in this section of the film. Yasumoto nurses Atoyo to health, and she reciprocates by caring for him when he falls ill, just as Nellie does in the novel when Vanya takes ill. 
Yasumoto and Vanya both spend a delirious night, with Atoyo and Nelly watching over them, reading their books, and finally laying down beside them to sleep on their bedding. Kurosawa's close modeling of his character on the literary figure shows just how fond he was of the Russian novelist's works. I mentioned previously how Dostoevsky's conception of a higher form of individualism resonated for Kurosawa. Beyond the ethical and aesthetic attributes shared in their art, Kurosawa and Dostoevsky shared similar experiences as well. They both flirted with left-wing politics when they were young and then later rejected those efforts. Let me pause here for a moment to consider this scene where Redbeard feeds Atoyo her medicine. This is one of many incidents, as I mentioned, that derive from Dostoevsky's novel. The older doctor tries to get Nellie to take her medicine, and as Redbeard does here, wears her down by sheer kindness. This is one of the few moments in the movie where we see Redbeard behaving with gentleness and tenderness toward a wounded individual. It requires Toshiro Mifune to project a different kind of emotion than he typically does. It was the ferocity and sheer power of his persona that attracted Kurosawa to this actor. Here, however, we require something different from him, and he does play it competently, but this is precisely the kind of scene that Takashi Shimura would have excelled at doing. Shimura could play it with absolute conviction and compassion, and with a gentle touch that Mufuni can't quite convey. This is, therefore, a scene in the film where one really misses the presence of that older actor that Kurosawa had once used so extensively in the 1940s and the 1950s. Let me now return to our discussion of Kurosawa and Dostoevsky and their political radicalism during their youth. When he was 19 and had ambitions to be a painter, Kurosawa joined the Proletarian Artists League, which was advocating a visual art that made direct political appeals to its viewers. He was jailed briefly as a member of the League, and as his radicalism deepened amidst the militaristic drift of Showa-era Japan, Kurosawa began to work as a courier for an illegal underground organization, ferrying messages and dodging the military police. Kurosawa later dismissed his leftist period as a youthful flirtation, and yet he stayed with the proletarian movement until 1932. Nevertheless, in his films, his heroes are not part of any organized political movement, and their efforts to transform society are always based on individual action. Like Kurosawa, Dostoevsky flirted with radical politics, frequenting the Pretorshevsky group in 1847, a literary circle that advocated a form of utopian socialism. In 1849, the police arrested Petrushevsky and 33 members of his circle, accused them of hatching a secret plan to liberate the serfs, and Dostoevsky spent four years in a labor camp. The epileptic seizures that Nelly suffers in the novel are based on Dostoevsky's own epilepsy, which surfaced at this time. Kurosawa, too, suffered from congenital epilepsy and had frequent seizures as a child, and as an adult, he would sometimes go into a trance-like state. He said, I never noticed it myself, but it seems I would sometimes have brief lapses during my work when I completely forgot what I was doing and went into a kind of trance. Kurosawa's major characters are all subjected to shocking experiences, as I have mentioned before. In Kurosawa's artistic vision, growth only comes through shock, and it may be that this vision has one of its roots in the director's own physiology, a physiology that would have prompted him to feel a deeper level of kinship with Dostoevsky. <laughs> This next scene in the film, where Otoyo goes outside to get money, 
so strikingly visualized by Kurosawa with all of this howling wind and dust and the extraordinary telephoto compression of his lenses. The images look virtually two-dimensional. This scene has its source in The Insulted and Injured. It's an almost exact transposition of the scene where Nellie leaves Vanya's house and begs for money on a nearby bridge. Vanya follows her, watches her beg, and then sees her enter a shop where she buys a teacup to replace one of Vanya's that she had defiantly broken. Vanya calls her name, she sees him, is startled, and drops the cup where it breaks upon the pavement. This scene is one of the few in the film that takes place outside the clinic, and we see again Kurosawa's almost offhand evocation of a detailed historical period. Kurosawa's sets were enormously budgeted. The production design of this film was one of the most elaborate in contemporary Japanese film, and yet he's showing us these sets in an almost subliminal fashion. He is evoking this world in tremendous detail. We see a merchant's shop fully stocked with goods, fishermen hauling in their net, samurai strolling across the bridge, and yet the scene itself is quite brief. It's a peep show, really, a fast glimpse of a richly detailed historical era. For most of the film, we are in the clinic, which is a sacred space of healing, a zone that is set off protectively from the surrounding world. When Kurosawa evokes that world, as he does here, it's in a flash, a quick peep, and full of detail and texture, but not a place where the characters linger. Let's allow this scene of a Toyo breaking the cup and then breaking down before Yasumoto to play out in all the artistry that Kurosawa has given us. This is Atoyo's moment of release. She has been inhibited, protectively insulating herself from the world and from all emotion. People cannot be trusted. They have hurt and abused her. She cannot reveal herself to them. And yet she has gone out to buy this cup for Yasumoto has opened herself up again to vulnerability and the prospect of being hurt. She is going to sink to her knees and release her emotion in a tremendously moving outburst. This wonderfully moving and cathartic moment is one that Kurosawa is filming almost literally from Dostoevsky's novel. Dostoevsky wrote, all the feeling which she had repressed for so long broke out at once in an uncontrollable outburst, and I understood the strange stubbornness of a heart that for a while shrinkingly masked its feeling, the more harshly, the more stubbornly, as the need for expression and utterance grew stronger, until the inevitable outburst came, when the whole being forgot itself and gave itself up to the craving for love, to gratitude, to affection, and to tears. She sobbed till she became hysterical. Dostoevsky then provided one source for the character of Atoyo. The other source on which Kurosawa based this character was an incident he witnessed during that period in his twenties when he lived with his brother Haigo in a little alleyway tenement in Tokyo that seemed to Kurosawa like a world from the feudal era. A floating world of colorful characters, down and out people who had no visible means of support but who depended on each other and who sustained their difficult lives with humor and resilient spirits. Haigo was working as a benshi, one who narrated silent films at the neighborhood theater. To Kurosawa, he seemed like a larger-than-life storybook character, a masterless samurai, held in awe and respected by all in the neighborhood. Despite the bonhomie that Kurosawa found in the neighborhood, nasty things happened there. 
An older man raped his young granddaughter. And parents regularly beat their stepchildren. These events impressed upon Kurosawa the existence of savagery within the human heart, and he remained haunted by this for the rest of his life. One incident in particular was terrifying. Sobbing, a woman from next door said that a neighbor was torturing her stepchild. She had bound the girl to a bed and was burning moxa on her bare chest. In traditional Japanese medicine, small amounts of moxa were burned on the skin to treat inflammation. But in this case, large amounts were apparently being used in a sadistic fashion. The sobbing woman begged Kurosawa to go and set the child free. Peeping in the window, Kurosawa found the girl tied to the bedpost. He went into the room and began to untie her. But she glared at him and angrily said that if she were untied, it would only make her stepmother torture her worse the next time. Kurosawa said that her reaction was so shocking, it felt like he had been slapped. Even if he freed her, he realized that she couldn't or wouldn't escape from that terrible environment. Pity for her would only lead to more trouble, an idea that he dramatizes in Yasumoto's encounter with the mantis. Kurosawa went away, but the scene of the beaten child lingered in his mind. He recreated that child in Otoyo, and his experience made him especially receptive to Dostoevsky's account of Nelly. Kurosawa's portrait of Otoyo, however, is not as terrifyingly bleak as what he encountered in that bedroom. Otoyo does not collaborate with her torturer, and her own innate goodness does prevail. Kurosawa now shows us the overcoming of this evil as Otoyo finds her restorative in caring for Yasumoto, who has fallen ill. Kurosawa returns to the idea of illness as metaphor. Yasumoto has not yet emerged as the enlightened character that we will know him by at the end of the film. First, he has to purge himself of the toxins of his existing social attitudes, and the fever will do that. He has fallen ill because he has seen too much of the world. Otoyo will find her salvation in caring for Yasumoto. Kurosawa is showing this action to us in an especially lovely way. As a series of vignettes, there will be seven episodes in all, linked with six dissolves. We are now inside of the second episode. Yasumoto had cared for Otoyo by smoothing her hair and refreshing her with a cold compress. She is now doing the same for him, as Kurosawa shows us the trust that is developing between them. Yasumoto's eyes meet hers, and she's not sure of this contact. She pulls away, not as severely this time, at least at first, but then the intensity of the intimacy becomes a little overwhelming, and she scurries over to the wall. Look at how Kurosawa hits her face with that key light, the same key light he had used in the brothel to depict her fear. With the dissolve, we are now in the third episode. Kurosawa has filmed each of the previous vignettes as a single take. Now, depicting the novel's action where Vanya awakens to find Nelly doing the housework to repay his kindness, he uses a cut to show us what Yasumoto sees, a Toyo scrubbing again. Like Yasumoto, we think at first that she has regressed. Then, with his total command of cinema, Kurosawa shows us that we're wrong about her behavior. As the camera dollied backward, we see that her movements are relaxed. She works freely, without the fixed intensity of before. Otoyo crosses now to the window, and Kurosawa is going to give us one of the film's magical moments. She begins wiping the floor below the window, but becomes aware that something is happening outside. Her curiosity aroused, she opens the window to reveal a gentle snowfall and the magical presence of Masaru Sato's music.
Atoyo's Delight has been scored by Kurosawa with music that derives from the second movement, the so-called surprise movement of Haydn's Symphony No. 94. This theme will become Atoyo's music, its joyous qualities serving to mark and to celebrate the transformation in her character that we are witnessing in these vignettes. Composer Sato has skillfully caught the action in the music, especially the exchange of smiles that light the faces of Yasumoto and Atoyo. Kurosawa's use of Brahms and Haydn in the film is wholly characteristic of his work and of his affection for the Western tradition of chamber and symphonic music. He used Ravel's Bolero in Rashomon, the Cuckoo Waltz in Drunken Angel, the Parade of Wooden Soldiers in Ikiru, Vivaldi's Concerto No. 9 in Madadayo, and for the big massacre scene in Ron, he asked composer Toru Takumitsu to write something that would sound like Mahler. Masaru Sato's music has now stopped. Five minutes into this series of vignettes, we have the first dialogue as Yasumoto asks for water. Atoyo rushes to get it and then realizes that she has let down her guard. When she withdraws again, Yasumoto's joke takes her out of her fugue state, overcomes her defenses, and the Haydn music catches this action, marks it, and celebrates it. Atoyo moves away, but this time it's not with fear, but shyness. She is not only learning to trust Yasumoto, but is coming to love him. With another dissolve, Kurosawa is going to take us to the scene from The Insulted and Injured, where Nelly reads Vanya's books. Yasumoto watches as she pages through his medical text, unfolding the illustrations, not knowing what they are, but fascinated by the book because it belongs to the only human being in the world who has shown her kindness. That kindness has deranged her view of life. There was some safety when she believed that only cruelty existed and that she could trust no one. Now that she has experienced kindness, the world has grown more complex and bewildering, and Atoyo's search for meaning has taken her to Yasumoto's book. He watches all of this and knows better than to interrupt. Yasumoto is becoming a better and more caring person. He is more responsive now to the emotional needs of his patients. He watches as Atoyo slumps over the desk. He has lost the arrogance that he had possessed when we met him. The fever has taken that out of him. Sleep is going to overtake her. She nods off again. And we come near the end of this fifth vignette. Kurosawa has subtly drawn us into a magic realm, the intimacy of this space between Atoyo and Yasumoto. The wordlessness of the energy that passes between them is an indicator of a deeper emotion that's developing, one that transcends words. Atoyo falls asleep, and as sleep overtakes Yasumoto too, Kurosawa dissolves to an image that derives from the Dostoevsky novel. Yasumoto waking to discover Atoyo, sleeping peacefully atop him. This was the sixth dissolve that Kurosawa used to link these seven vignettes. And as Masaru Sato's music draws to its conclusion, Yasumoto pats Atoyo's hand and she awakens, returning us to the more ordinary world of dialogue. This takes us out of this special emotional time and space of these scenes, the magic cast by their spell, 
and into a more normative cinematic world where dialogue carries much, if not most, of the narrative meaning. Except for that brief moment in the fifth episode when Yasumoto asked for water, Kurosawa has given us an eight-minute sequence of wordless pantomime. It is a masterful sequence that shows what Kurosawa meant when he said that he wanted to push filmmaking to its limit. The ultimate truth that Kurosawa pursued was not a matter of spectacle. It was the truth of the human heart, a heart that contains savagery, yes, but also the redemptive and forgiving qualities that he shows in Otoyo. We are now well past the midpoint of this film, and Kurosawa is not reaching for great effects, but rather for the simplest and tiniest of effects. Kurosawa's courage lies in going for small gestures, a Toyo's smile, the opening of a window, and making them the heart of his film at a time when other directors would worry about losing the audience in a three-hour film, and would therefore aim for big climaxes. But as Kurosawa goes along, he gets far away from big effects, pushing film to its limit by using it to examine the small things, the interior things. When Yasumoto tells Otoyo that there are people like Redbeard, he impresses on her the same lesson that Vanya tried to impress on Nellie. Redbeard then enters the room, smells the air, makes a face, and says that it stinks in here. We have been so transported by Kurosawa's artistry and by the glow of intimacy that he has evoked between Yasumoto and Otoyo that his remark is a little shocking. And then we realize, of course, that the room would stink. It's been closed, and one of them has been sick. Redbeard's remark brings us down from the heights of emotional ecstasy where Kurosawa had taken us. <laughs> Masai accompanies Redbeard, and her presence has produced a big change in Otoyo. Thus far, Masai has been a part of the backstory in the film. Yasumoto was engaged to Shiguza, the daughter of his mentor, Dr. Amano. And while he was studying in Nagasaki, Shiguza breaks their engagement, causing affront to Yasumoto and shame within Amano's family. Seeing Masai, Otoyo withdraws again into her shell. She knows that Masai is a proper match for him, not her. Act one ends there. Act two begins with this visit by Yasumoto to his mother, with Masai attending. This is the kind of scene that Kurosawa almost never filmed. I have to say almost, because this is one of the few rule-breaking examples and we will have another in the family scene that precedes the wedding at the end of the film. It's a perfectly conventional scene of ordinary domestic family drama. Yasumoto's mother broaches the idea to her son that he think of Masai as a potential wife, and she points out Masai's virtues in this respect. This is the kind of traditional family scene, parents talking about marriage with their children, that so many Japanese directors have filmed, but never Kurosawa. His heroes are alone in the world, in an existential sense and often in a literal sense. Redbeard has no family, neither does Kambai Shimada in Seven Samurai, nor Subaki Sanjuro in Yojimbo, neither does the doctor Sanada nor the gangster Matsunaga in Drunken Angel. Yuki, the heroine of No Regrets for Our Youth, has parents, but she forfeits and rejects her family and class heritage to go and live as a peasant. Kanjai Watanabe, the hero of Ikiru, had a wife, but she is dead, and there is such a rift between he and his son that it's as if there were no son at all. Kurosawa's characters are not bound within the sociology of the Japanese family or within the constraints of normative society at all. They do not derive their identity from these social groups, as other Japanese of their generation do. This is why they are so singular and so odd within a traditional cultural context. As a filmmaker, Kurosawa is uninterested in the quotidian rituals of everyday life. 
He is interested in the subversion of these rituals, in characters who live in ways, like his brother Hygo did, that burst the boundaries of normal convention. This scene, by contrast, is a scene of and about social convention. We see how ordinary this aspect of Yasumoto's life is. As the scene ends, Masai gives us another indication of her suitability as a marriage partner. She has made a kimono for a toyo to acknowledge and to repay her kindness toward Yasumoto. With his customary filmmaking elegance, Kurosawa will show us the results of Masai's gesture. As this scene ends, he takes us with a wipe to the scene in the clinic where the staff, the group of women who serve as a chorus, are scolding a toyo for throwing her kimono in the mud. In shooting this scene, Kurosawa uses his familiar two-camera setup at right angles, but he chooses to play most of the action as we are viewing it now in this camera setup. When he cuts to the alternate setup, camera number two, we will see why he has chosen to play most of the action in this scene. In a moment, Atoyo is going to run off screen with shame. As she does so, Kurosawa will shift his view by 90 degrees. Here she goes. And the cut is coming up. Here it is. The point of view this camera provides is not very satisfactory. The positioning of the actors and the compression of space by the telephoto lens makes it hard to see where people are in the shot and where they are in relation to others, so he cuts back to the other view. The frame had been looking very crowded, but in this camera position, the composition is much clearer. It is interesting that he made the choice to edit the scene at all, using footage from that second camera, rather than doing the scene as one long take from this more satisfactory angle. Note also the perspective error that we've been pointing out several times previously. When he cut from camera two back to camera one, the characters who had seemed to be on top of one another are now shown as being at a considerable distance from one another. Otoyo's reaction to Masai and her trashing of the kimono are more business that derives from Dostoevsky's novel, The Insulted and Injured. Vanya is in love with a woman named Natasha, and when Nellie realizes this, she is crushed, and she withdraws from Vanya, even to the point of running away from him. Dostoevsky, in his novel, gives us a story of unreciprocated love. Like Atoyo, Nellie shows her distaste for individuals by ripping up clothing that has been given to them. Unlike Atoyo, though, she is positively rapacious in her destruction of clothing. In the novel, she tears up several dresses because they are associated with people that she does not like. We pick Atoyo up, cleaning the dishes in the staff kitchen. She sees a shadow going up the stairs. Kurosawa brings in now another new and major character into the film, so late in the narrative. This is Chobo, the wild boy whom Atoyo will care for, and who, through that caring, will provide for her complete recovery. The actor who plays Chobo is making his first appearance in a Kurosawa film, but he will return in later pictures. Yoshitaki Zushi, playing Chobo, will appear as Roku-chan, the trolley crazy boy in Dodeska Den, and as a soldier in one of the episodes of Dreams. Kurosawa began the film as a linear story of Yasumoto's moral education and experiences at the clinic. But now, in this late section of the picture, all narrative design is gone. Yasumoto is no longer the central character 
and Redbeard has become a background figure entirely. Kurosawa focuses on Otoyo, and then on Chobo and Otoyo, and the change of heart among the clinic staff toward both of these characters. Instead of a linear narrative that has one main line of development and leading characters that we will follow along the length of that plot line, Kurosawa is moving in different directions as the story becomes more diffuse, more episodic and decentered. The focus will come back to Yasumoto and Redbeard at the very end, but until then, Kurosawa is going to spend time looking at the developing intimacy between Otoyo and this new character. The non-linear design of the last part of Redbeard and the way that the picture will end without any climax or resolution prefigures the direction in which Kurosawa will go in his filmmaking after 1965. In this respect, as in so many others, Redbeard is the pivotal film, ending one line of stylistic development in Kurosawa's work while opening others. Kurosawa's next picture, Dodeska Den, which he made as an independent production, has no linear narrative whatsoever and very nearly has no narrative at all. While Kurosawa returned to narrative in his next three pictures, Dersu Uzala, Kagamusha, and Ron, he abandoned it entirely in Dreams, which is a collection of vignettes corresponding to dreams Kurosawa claimed to have on a continuing basis. There is little necessary connection among the episodes that determines their order. They could easily be rearranged in a different sequence. And in his final two films, Rhapsody in August and Madadayo, the storylines are very slight and diffuse. If Redbeard then, in its last act, becomes a most unconventional epic film, it does so in ways that signal Kurosawa's changing interests in narrative, a lessening of his desire to tell the kind of stories he had been telling for decades and in the manner that he had chosen. The diffusion of the narrative line in the last act of Redbeard can make it a little difficult for a first-time viewer to discern the organization that ties the film together. But that organization is there, and it lies in Kurosawa's reconstruction of the Buddhist notion of karma, a doctrine that proposed equivalence through time of good fortune for good deeds and of misfortune for evil deeds. If the reward for good deeds did not come in this life, it surely would come in the next life. Although Redbeard said earlier that there were no cures, and although what Kurosawa shows us in the film is a conception of life and time as an eternal cycle of suffering and woe, he shows us a way out in the film's last acts. That way out lies in the small acts of charity that the characters perform one for another. Through this, Kurosawa shows us a positive force of goodwill, spreading among Yasumoto, Otoyo, and the staff, a power that expresses the moral lessons exemplified by Sahachi and by Redbeard. At the same time that he shows this spreading chain of goodwill, Kurosawa has rarely portrayed the world as being so starkly terrible. His vision of life is darkening, presaging the onset of the bitter period in his life and art that lasts until the end of the 1980s. He has not yet abandoned heroes, though, or the possibilities for the heroic transformation of life. But as a measure of his deepening pessimism, it is now the small acts of charity toward others that hold the possibility of redemption and transformation. These small acts of charity are only possible in a special protected place like the clinic, and not the world at large, whose terrible power overwhelms those who must live in it. Kurosawa again evokes the concept of poverty as an interior condition in Chobo's descriptions about his family and their continuing hunger. Chobo remarks that his family's impoverished state has dulled his parents' ethical sense, eroding their ability to discipline him for his thievery. 
Kurosawa presents this scene between Chobo and Otoyo in a way that recalls the sequence in Yojimbo, where he used the sliding shutters on the windows of Ganji's Inn to introduce various characters passing by out on the street. Each time in Yojimbo, we see a perfectly framed group of characters through the peephole openings of Ganji's windows. In this scene in Redbeard, Kurosawa gives us the peephole views using little windows as formed by the edges of the blankets and by shooting along the top of the fence posts from which they are hanging, everything rendered into two-dimensional terms by the long lens. As Chobo talks with Otoyo about his family, Otoyo builds her sense of self by giving him moral instruction, an instruction that parallels what we have seen between Kyojo Nide and Yasumoto. As they talk, Kurosawa cuts to this wider framing, and we see Yasumoto and the staff woman eavesdropping on the pair. Here he uses the vignette effect provided by the blankets to window box the exchange of gifts that marks the change in Otoyo and its effect on Chobo. As she makes this present to Chobo, we hear the Haydn theme beginning again, returning us for the first time since the caregiving scenes between Yasumoto and Otoyo to this theme of the reopening of her wounded heart. Kurosawa uses music in a special and unusual way. He uses it in a declamatory manner to announce, to point to special moments of moral significance in the drama, as he did in Ikiru, when Watanabe's enlightenment is celebrated with the song Happy Birthday. Now that this scene draws to its close and Otoyo is about to send Chobo home, the Haydn theme is not doing what movie music usually does. It's not capturing emotion that is being expressed in the scene. It's being used more conceptually and thematically. It's telling us about the significance of Otoyo's actions, linking them to the earlier episodes where Yasumoto looked after her, and bringing Yasumoto and the staff woman into the network of moral action that Otoyo's gesture is instigating. We are now in another scene where the cooks act as chorus with their actions a commentary on the story. The eavesdropping woman wants to be sure that Otoyo gets enough to eat and has some to spare for Chobo. The next time we see this group of women, they will come to the active defense of Otoyo, braining the brothel madam in the head and sending her on her way. Kurosawa brings the mantis back into the storyline in order to make an interestingly harsh point about the world, namely that sanity can produce despair and even a suicidal response. Kurosawa gives us another two-camera scene, building it in the editing as four pairs of shots, each pair deriving from footage shot by each camera. One camera is in a low-angle position, this one here, and it is shooting with the smaller angle of view to give us medium shots of Osugi, prostrate with shame over neglecting her job responsibilities. The other camera, this setup here, is elevated in a high angle position and gives us a master shot framing of all the characters in the scene. And the telephoto compression is especially noticeable in those master shots. He lets most of the action play out in this framing here and he intercuts the closer shots of Osugi here for emphasis. Kurosawa in this scene raises the idea of suicide, but he does so in order to reject it, a rejection that is wholly consistent with the attitude that he has expressed in earlier films. Suicide has never really been an option for his characters, especially not in the ritualized form that suicide assumed among Japan's warrior classes. Despite all of the samurai movies that he made, Kurosawa never filmed a scene of ritual suicide, and his main characters, whether samurai or not, never opt for suicide as a solution to their problems. 
the dying Watanabe in Ikiru thinks about it, but rejects it. The warrior in Ron would do it during the scene where his sons attack and massacre his men, but Kurosawa makes sure the scabbard is empty and there are no swords nearby. While his screen characters are strangers to suicide, Kurosawa was not. His brother Haigo killed himself, and several years after completing Redbeard, Kurosawa tried to end his own life. There is then an intriguing disparity between the actions that Kurosawa permitted his characters in the realm of his art and the realities that he experienced in his own life. Redbeard reminds the mantis's father that he has let her down. In this scene, Redbeard returns to the center of the action, providing the kind of moral authority that we had witnessed so often earlier in the film. Perhaps Kurosawa was thinking that we might have forgotten about our main character, from whom the film is titled, and so he returns to him here in this scene. In the next scene, we're going to have the brothel madam returning to try to reclaim Atoyo. It's a scene that contains some of the film's most extraordinary telephoto compression. As it begins, Otoyo is hanging wash, and Kurosawa has the camera at the junction of two streets. He pans left to show the madam approaching in the distance, Otoyo's reaction in the foreground, and then pans right to show the doctors approaching from that end. As she runs to them, she seems to be running in place because of the telephoto compression. In this shot, the compression is even more extreme. As the madam jogs toward the doctors, she seems to be running in place because of how flat the lens makes the image look. He now cuts to a 90 degree shot of her face. The camera here is very far away. This close up is due entirely to the lens's magnification of the image. I mentioned earlier some of the reasons that Kurosawa chose to film almost exclusively with telephoto lenses. This scene has shown us another reason. Kurosawa loved to shoot characters on the run or galloping on horseback, moving toward or away from the camera in telephoto shots. He loved the way the long lens reconfigured their movement, as it does here in the shots where Otoyo runs to the doctors or the madam runs toward her. Ordinarily in cinema, we see movement toward or away from the camera as if it is happening in three dimensions because of perspective cues like size change. The telephoto lens distorts all of that information. It erases those cues. If you look again at those shots where Atoyo or the madam run toward the doctors or the camera, you'll notice that they don't change much in size as they get closer to or farther from the camera. By erasing cues like size change, the telephoto lens makes movement appear more abstract. Intellectually, we know the character is approaching or receding, but perceptually, we don't see the kind of visual information that is normally associated with that action. The telephoto lens makes movement more abstract by taking it out of the three-dimensional space in which it typically occurs in cinema and by putting into two-dimensional space, where the perceptual correlates it normally produces are lacking. Kurosawa loved this abstraction. This is the other reason that he uses those lenses. They stylize movement and heighten our awareness of the presence of his style. We return now to the Otoyo Chobo storyline with a reprise of the Haydn theme as Otoyo brings the hungry boy some food. She finds him sitting morosely, looking like one of those jars he's sitting next to. Unbeknownst to Atoyo, Chobo's family has decided to end its misery with a collective suicide. Note how the Kurosawa wind is back, ominously commenting on this threat. Chobo, though, is only going to talk to her of pleasant things. He is going to tell her that he's going away, to a place where there is plenty of food, lots of fun, flowers, and birds. Chobo is fully aware of the fate his family has chosen for him, yet he elects to use his imagination to transform this unpleasant reality into a dream of happiness and comfort. Long before he made dreams in 1990, 
Kurosawa had been interested in the role that fantasy and dreams and the imagination can play in transforming unpleasant realities. One of the segments in his 1970 film, Dodeska Den, showed a father and son living in the empty, decaying frame of an automobile in wrenching, crushing poverty. But they consoled one another with dreams of wonderful houses and palaces that one day surely would be their home. In earlier films as well, Kurosawa showed how dreams become a refuge from reality when it becomes too terrible. In Scandal, a picture he made in 1950, a dying tubercular child dreams of being in a more pleasant place. By contrast, in his 1990 film, Dreams, his thinking had changed and he celebrated dreams as the source of all creativity in life and art. In Redbeard, though, he is not yet at that point in his thinking. And so Chobo's fantasy of abundance is consistent with the way that Kurosawa had been showing dreams up until this point. They make the unbearable a little more bearable. Chobo's efforts to escape in fantasy are doomed. His family will take the poison, and it will be up to the doctors and finally to Atoyo and the staff to rescue him. Before the family is brought in, we have two scenes that serve to establish Yasumoto's determination to stay and work at the clinic. In this first one, Kurosawa gives us another image of pure cinema. Yasumoto, Mori, and Redbeard are lined up across the width of the tohoscope frame. The only way to reformat this shot for television is to chop off one of the three doctors. This scene plays as one long take, and the lighting is especially striking with the shadows of the three men looming across the back wall. Redbeard gives Yasumoto another chance to live the life he once wanted, but Yasumoto has decided to stay and work at the clinic. With a wipe, Kurosawa takes us to this scene in the pharmacy. Japanese medicine of the period was predominantly dispensed in the form of powders, and doctors grew their own herbs to use these in their preparations. This is another of Kurosawa's long takes, an entire shot done as one scene, as Mari and Yasumoto talk about their marriage prospects, and Mari points out how like Redbeard Yasumoto has become. The lighting is especially exquisite, with two principal sources and a lot of fill light. Kurosawa bounces one source right off the wall of cabinets behind the doctors, to make that area bright and hot and draw our eyes to it. The other source is off camera and to screen left, aimed at Mori to throw his shadow on the wall behind him. The ostensible source for the scene's illumination is the slender candle sitting between them, but it's not throwing any of the bright electric light that we see. In the next moment, one of the cooks is going to charge into the room. And as she does so, you can see that the light that was on Mari is bouncing now off the wall when one of the cooks comes in. You can also see that it's a highly directional and focused light source. When she walks into it here, only the area below her sash is brightly illuminated. Her upper body and face fall into some shadow. As they exit and she collapses, the two hot areas on the back wall produced by the source light are clearly visible. With his customary aggressiveness, Kurosawa wipes to the next scene, Atoyo waiting outside as the doctors examine Chobo and his family. This scene, the preceding one in the pharmacy, and the next scene inside the room with Chobo make up an 8 minute and 15 second block of the film, and Kurosawa does it all only in three shots. Each scene is done as a single long take, about a minute and three quarters for the pharmacy scene, a minute and a half for this scene, and nearly five minutes for the next scene in the room with the family. His cinematic thinking is occurring entirely now in terms of lengthy extended scenes, with little movement on screen for much of their duration. For almost 30 seconds, this scene had no movement at all, as Atoyo stands immobile with anxiety over Chobo's fate. Then the bodies come out, and Kurosawa pans and tilts the camera to reframe the action and follow her movements. He doesn't cut to a new setup. 
He's not thinking about the scene in terms of editing and the kind of optical movement across shots that it creates. He stays within the shot and on the characters inside of the frame. This scene ends with another of the film's invocations about the world being too much, being too horrible. When Kurosawa cuts to the next scene, inside the room with Chobo and Redbeard, it's going to put us into a very long take, nearly five minutes in duration. He's giving us now another of his rafters shots. As he did in the scene showing Sahachi's death, he's got his camera way up high in the rafters of the set. Shooting down from this height with long lenses creates the same smoky two-dimensional look we saw in the earlier scene. Watch now as the cameraman pans and tilts to follow Otoyo and Yasumoto over to Chobo. You'll see a little jerkiness to the camera's moves, especially as Chobo comes into frame. It's extremely hard to do camera movement with telephoto lenses, even simple movements like pans and tilts. Because everything seen by the lens is so magnified, any optical move that the camera makes is also magnified, including any unsteadiness that accompanies it. Kurosawa has given his camera operator quite a difficult task, and given the constraints that Kurosawa imposed, the operator executes it quite well. This rafter shot is an extremely unconventional place to put the camera. According to the norms of conventional filmmaking, it's an extremely odd way to approach the filming of the scene. But Kurosawa really has no alternative, not if he wants to film with a telephoto lens. As in the scene with Sahachi, he's blocked the actors so that they are clustered around Chobo. And this means that the only point of view he can get on the action is from very high up. And it has to be at a distance so that his long lens can focus on the action. Using this lens, he can't bring the camera close to the actors. He can't put it right on them. He doesn't have the depth of field to do that. Furthermore, he's not going to bring the cameras inside the scene by using multiple setups or by restaging the action for takes by cameras in different locations. That approach, especially the staging of action for alternate setups, is the conventional approach of filmmakers everywhere. Given his choices about shooting method, about blocking the action, about depth of field, he's got no alternative to a rafter shot. But that's not a problem for him. Given his telephoto aesthetics, it's a shot that will create the kind of two-dimensional image that he loves. The doctors in this scene find themselves in the uncomfortable position of trying to save people who'd much prefer to leave this life. For Kurosawa, we are all condemned to endure life, and the ethical outlook that underlies his art does not acknowledge suicide as a viable means for escaping from life's cruelties. I have alluded to this earlier. Accordingly, in this scene, the doctors must work to save the family, even as the father sleeps more peacefully than he ever has. The wife asks, why must the doctors try to save them? The wife remarks that the father thinks he's already dead and in the next world. The doctors also find themselves in the uncomfortable situation of confronting the limits of their medical knowledge. Here, as elsewhere in the film, Kurosawa depicts them as strung very far out on the edge of medicine, where it falls off into the mysteries of life and death and the terrain of superstition and folk belief that address these mysteries in ways that medicine cannot. Redbeard had complained earlier that science knows little of life or its secrets. At the end of this scene, we will get an object lesson about this. Chobo will slip into a final spasm, his breath will come in short and rapid bursts, and Atoyo will know that he is dying. The doctors are helpless. 
All they really can do is watch and try to keep him comfortable. And now this extraordinary, eerie moment where the cooks begin to call him back. Kurosawa begins now to develop a very different approach to the issue of death and dying than he has ever shown in his work before. His thoughts about death and about his own dying led him to make Ikiru, but when the old bureaucrat in that film dies from cancer, the end of life holds no mystery. It does hold the existential challenge of finding a way to live well, but when he dies, he is gone. That's it. The park he built remains, but the man has ceased to exist. Now, however, in this scene in Redbeard, Kurosawa acknowledges for the first time in his work the existence of mystery, of death as a threshold to the unknown. He now shows that human thought and perception have boundaries, and these boundaries are not just the 19th century medical world that the film depicts. They are cosmological boundaries, and contemplating them perhaps enabled Kurosawa to move from the anxieties of dying that he depicted in Ikiru to the tranquil acceptance of life's end that he shows in Madadayo, his final film. Chobo is saved, but Yasumoto's face registers the difficulty he has squaring this with his medical approach to life and death. Redbeard takes it with more equanimity. His philosophy acknowledges the mystery more readily than does Yasumoto's. As the cooks call him and a solitary tear falls into the well, Kurosawa ends the scene with a fade and this reminder of how little we know about our own lives, the conditions under which we live and the terms by which we struggle. With the fade that ends this scene, we finish act two of the film's second part. Kurosawa begins the coda with this scene of domestic family ritual. It puts him back in what is for him that strange territory of conventional family sociology, which he has never been very interested to explore as a filmmaker. As one sign of this, he omits the marriage ceremony. We're not going to see that. And instead, he gives us this scene leading up to it. As if to acknowledge the terrain of ordinary family drama into which he is straying here, Kurosawa gives us a surprise appearance by the last actor we'd ever expect to appear in one of his films. That actor is Chishu Ryu, who will play Yasumoto's father, and he is the first performer who will be entering the scene in the next moment. Redbeard looks down the corridor. He too is impatient, like Yasumoto, for things to get underway. Here comes Chishu Ryu. He's the great actor so closely identified with the films about the Japanese family made by Yasujiro Ozu, one of Japan's finest filmmakers and one who, in style and sensibility, is quite the opposite of Kurosawa. Where Kurosawa is drawn to the excessive and extraordinary, Ozu was drawn to the everyday and he made films about ordinary family life in a changing Japan. Kurosawa's characters are engaged in huge struggles against social ills and injustice, whereas Ozu's characters show none of this rebelliousness. They conform to custom and lead quiet lives, and they submit to the sorrows that life brings, knowing that these are the way of things and cannot be changed. Accordingly, Kurosawa loved Toshiro Mifune for the reasons that we've specified earlier. Ozu, by contrast, wanted actors who were slower than Mifune in their reaction times, and he gave them a lot of time on screen to meditate and sit quietly. Chishu Ryu is the archetypal embodiment of the aesthetic of quiet and stillness that pervades an Ozu movie. Ryu often played the father in Ozu's family dramas and comedies, and he is identified with Ozu's films as closely as Toshiro Mifune is identified with Kurosawa's. To suddenly have Chishu Ryu appearing here and playing a father no less is perhaps Kurosawa's way of saying that he is out of his territory here and of begging our pardon for straying so far from his usual terrain. 
Ryu only has one or two lines, but his presence overshadows everything else about the scene. He won't speak his line until the end, and it will take us out of the scene and its family drama. Kurosawa is filming this with great beauty, showing that he is very responsive to the traditional aesthetic qualities of Japanese culture. The ceremonial gathering, the formality with which people move and speak, the beauty of the kimonos, and the hushed and gentle softness of the falling snow. All of these things convey aesthetics that we don't normally associate with Kurosawa. The scene hints at another kind of filmmaker that Kurosawa might have become. He does use the scene to resolve a few plot points. Yasumoto acknowledges Chiguza and her child, much to Dr. Amano's relief, and he tells Masai that his decision to stay at the clinic will have repercussions for the kind of life that they'll lead and asks that she consider this carefully. The film's drama is really over by this point, but Kurosawa liked these codas. They give the audience a little breathing room at the end of the story an opportunity to reflect on its meanings and on the values and the moral lesson that Kurosawa has aimed to convey. <clears throat> and so we end the film where we began, outside the clinic gate. For Yasumoto and Redbeard, it's not an ending at all, merely the beginning of their work together and the start of Yasumoto's career. But for us, it is an end. We now have to bid farewell to our heroes, in fact, to all of Kurosawa's heroes. Yasumoto and Redbeard are the last of those. And when they walk back inside the clinic, Kurosawa ends an era in his filmmaking, a huge chapter in his career, and a tremendously exciting period in world cinema. Hereafter, Kurosawa will be making a very different kind of film, and will be working very infrequently. After this, the films will move Kurosawa from heroes to a more detached and less popular kind of filmmaking. He will continue to make films for another 28 years, but we will never again see the likes of Yasumoto and Red Beard. Thank you.